Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, ready if you are to probe once again into the depths of imagination and the heights of illusion. Illusion. What is life? A philosopher asked. And to answer his own question, he replied, Life is an illusion, a shadow, a story. And this may well be. But in that event, we may well ask, Whose illusions? Whose shadow? Whose story? Is this life only a dream? Are we characters in our own reverie? If that is true, and it may well be, who and what are we when we awake? Work is for suckers. There's a quicker, easier way. And the jails are filled with people who took it. If you work, you can put money in the bank. The idea is to take money out of the bank. Ah, but you have to deposit it first. No, you don't. Not if you walk in with a gun. And suppose... The police try to stop you. Well, you just have to shoot it out. Have you ever shot it out with the police? Well, have you? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know, Mary baby? Wouldn't you like to know? Our mystery drama, Death is a Dream, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Premium Time, 10.36. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little world is rounded with a sleep. So said William Shakespeare, and so lives Mary Catherine Collins. Mary Catherine lives in a world of never-ending nightmare. It's a world of heart-stabbing terror and apprehension. Every night, there's the dream, the same dream. It refuses to leave her. She can only fight off sleep for so long, and then the dream once again overwhelms her. And each night, the dream is exactly the same in every minute detail. 
It's just the way it was when she dreamed it for the first time on that night of August the 14th. That night is seared in her memory forever. I see Joe. My brother Joe. And he's walking, walking his beat. The night's dark. And a soft rain is falling. And drops of water glisten on his black policeman's raincoat. And he's whistling that tune, the tune I never heard anywhere else. And he always said, one day I'll tell you the name of it. And he's walking down that street. That old, tired, run-down street, alone. All alone. And because it's my dream, he doesn't see what I see. Just around the corner. A man. It's too hard to make out his face in the dark. But he carries a box in one hand. And a pistol in the other. And he's climbing out of the window of a warehouse. Just as my brother's about to turn the corner. And I scream, look out, Joe. Look out, he's got a gun. Joe! Uh, but he didn't hear me. He didn't hear me. My brother never heard me. Oh, oh it was a dream. Yes. Who... Uh, yes, just a minute. Who... Who is it? Mary? It's Frank Miller. Oh! Uh, guess what? What is it, Frank? Come on in. Mary, I, uh... You... You're here because of... Joe. Y yes, Mary. I, uh... Something has happened... To Joe. And you've come to tell me yourself. Mary. Joe... Is dead. <laughs> He's dead, isn't he? Why else would you be here at this time of the night? Joe's dead. Yes, Mary. He was killed by some hoodlum who was robbing a warehouse at the end of Water Street. Mary, who told you? I saw it happen. I saw it happen. Now, Mary, you must get a hold of yourself. He was shot just as he turned the corner. His revolver was still in his holster. He never had a chance. Joe never had a chance. I know how hard it is, Mary. I saw it happen. Oh, why? Why did I see it happen? I saw it happen. As if I were sitting in a theater. And it was all taking place on a giant screen. And from that night on, I saw it happen. Every night. Every night I was condemned to relive it again. And again. And again. Lieutenant Miller. Who? Oh, look. Uh, tell her... Uh... No, tell her to come in. Mary. It's good to see you. Is it? Good to see me, Frank. Mary, how can you say that? I'm becoming a pest. Admit it, Frank. Oh, I'll admit no such thing. I haunt you day and night. I pester you with phone calls every hour on the hour. Well, it's it's understandable. I, I know how much your brother Joe meant to you. No, you don't. Nobody could ever hope to understand how much Joe meant to me. Mary, I'm sorry. We're all sorry. But sorrow gets us nowhere. It's been six weeks now since Joe was killed. Mary, we've had every available man out on this case. I know. It isn't your fault. But I know how the department works. And little by little, my brother is going to become a statistic. Just another police officer killed in the line of duty by an unknown assailant. Mary, we're doing our best. I didn't say you weren't. What I'm saying is that your best isn't good enough. That's not fair. Fair? Oh. What's fair? Was it fair for my brother to be gunned down without warning? His revolver still in his holster? Oh, why did he have to be killed? Joe was a good cop. He gave everybody a break, and he liked to help people. Why did he... Look, Mary, we'll get the killer. No, I don't think so. And so that's why... 
That's why what? That's why I'm going to get him myself. Well, just what exactly does that mean? It means I'll have to get him myself. Well, how can you... I plan to spend a great deal of time in that neighborhood. Doing... Doing what? Teaching school. Teaching school? Why not? I'm a school teacher. (laughs) But you're teaching uptown. I've asked... For a transfer. Do you know what those kids are like? What that area is like? It was where my brother worked and was murdered. What can you possibly hope to... I intend to become a part of that neighborhood. (laughs) You mean you'll poke around and ask questions? You can put it any way you like. You realize you can get yourself killed? I have a job to do. I'd taken step one. I'd made the decision to leave the soft and delightful job at North Crescent High School, known and with good reason as the country club. My principal was completely at a loss to understand why I'd want to leave his pleasant, well-ordered school for what he could only describe as the witch's cauldron at Southern District. Of course, there was no way I could explain it. And now, step two, to be accepted by John Hodges, principal at Southern District. And suddenly I realized it wasn't going to be automatic. You thought we were so desperate for teachers here we'd grab anybody who walks in? Well, truthfully, I didn't think there'd be... Well, the first part of your assumption is correct. We are desperate for teachers. Teachers. That's why we have to be very particular. But I... Yes, Miss Collins. I have a good record. Miss Collins, tell me. What are you doing here? Well, isn't that obvious? I want to teach English at your school. Why? Because. uh, Because I'm an English teacher. Look, we've done more fencing in the five minutes you've been in this office than all of the three musketeers put together. You have had the plum of the system. A job at North Crest that mostly motivated kids from comfortably situated families. Ninety percent of them go on to college. Do you know what we have here? Oh, I think so. You think so? Miss Collins... I know... They are difficult children. Difficult? (laughs) Yes. Children? No. These are only adolescents chronologically. Well, I felt that there was no challenge at North Crescent. I see. And that here I would be tested to the utmost of my ability. I want to see if I can measure up. Well, Mr. Hodges... Won't you say something? Miss Collins, I... I am seldom, if ever, at a loss for words. But I simply cannot figure you out. You mean you don't believe me? I need teachers. (laughs) Cavalier as I may sound, I need teachers. I work best with seniors. Do you? Yes, especially with the advanced lit courses. Do you think you can teach Shakespeare? I've done it. Okay. Good luck. We'll set up a program for you. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. And I know that I'll be successful. I'm sure you will. Provided you survive. And so the time arrived for me to report for my first class. And I paused at the doorway and looked into the room. My heart did more than sink. It almost died within me. That classroom was a madhouse. They were tough kids. I almost regretted my transfer, but I remembered my brother, Joe. And I knew I'd have to go through with this somehow. I needed a reason to be in that neighborhood. And I had to start with a nucleus of friends. Or even acquaintances. Hey, look at this. Hey, is that the door? Hey, is this the teacher? Oh, uh, come on. Hey, you... hey teacher, oh, what are you doing? Hey, now, huh? This hey. class. Hey, Chase, what are you doing tonight? Please. <laughs> hey, look at her. Hey, please, 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 please. This class will come to order. Please. Oh, I'm going to order a couple of beers. Hey, what are you going to have, Chuck? Hey, you, who's got the dice? Let's get the game going. Now, you, oh, you in the blue shirt, yeah. you report to the principal's office. Oh, how about that? I didn't know and you, idea. you there with the red hair, will you please sit down? Oh, that's a wig. I'll take it off. That young lady near the window. <laughs> yeah, but she ain't no lady. Hey, 
Hey, there ain't no action around here. Let's, let's get dance. Out of here. Let's dance, Al. Let's move it. All right, now. Turn off that radio. Yep, yeah, hey, Teach, can I have the pleasure of this dance? Yeah, I've huh? seen it first. Will you uh, please turn off that radio? Now turn that off. I'm sorry, Mr. Hodges. It was a fiasco. I know. I was just across the hall. I saw it all. You saw it? And you permitted it? We have to find out if you can control these kids. You could empty the room by sending everyone to my office for discipline, but that's not teaching. I'm afraid you'd better go back to North... Oh, no, please, please, please give me another chance. Why? Because I could understand if you liked these kids, but... But you don't. Oh, I, I, I do, really. No. And they sensed it the minute you walked in. They saw it. They, they felt it. They felt what? Your hostility. Your contempt. Oh, that's not true. It isn't. You are repelled by these youngsters, and it shows. Now, Miss Collins, you'd better go back to the well-ordered world of North Crescent. Oh, please, Mr. Hodges, you must give me another chance. I'm sorry, Miss Collins, it won't work. No, you can't turn me down. Miss Collins, I will give you another chance on one condition. You must tell me the real reason you want to work here. But I told you. No, you didn't. And now I insist. Very well, Mr. Hodges. I'll tell you. Well, what will Mary tell him? The real reason? If she does, how will he take it? If not the real one, then she needs a reason that sounds convincing. And can she make one up on the spur of the moment? One thing we know, Mary must have the job if she's to have any chance of finding her brother Joe's killer. Well, fortunately, she has a few moments to think about it before I return with Act Two. Things are seldom what they seem. Skim milk masquerades as cream. It's one of Mary Catherine Collins' favorite verses. And now, it's going to form a pattern for the next portion of her life. She is attempting to masquerade as a dedicated teacher in a slum district school in order to find out, if she can, the identity of her brother's killer. But her first problem is to get the job. And John Hodges, the principal, has very grave doubts indeed. Mr. Hodges, I agree. It's time we told each other the truth. Uh, let's say it's time you told me the truth. Uh, my name, Collins. Does that mean anything to you? Collins? Collins, no, I don't think so. Well, almost two months ago, a police officer was killed in this neighborhood. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I knew him. Officer Collins. I never even knew his last name. Everyone called him Joe. He was my brother. Oh. Oh, I am sorry. And then you know that he was an unusual man. Yes. He could have risen high. He could have gone far in the department, but he chose not to. He felt that good cops were needed in places like this. And I feel that if I could take his place somehow, if I could be the kind of influence in the classroom that he tried to be out on the street. Well, I won't be the one to refuse you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hodges. Miss Collins, why... Why do you think your brother was so successful with the people in our neighborhood? Well, I guess... I suppose... He had a gift. He surely did. And do you know what that gift was? He liked the people. That's 90% of what you need, Miss Collins. I had told him a half-truth, but it was enough to nail down the job. And now, in order to keep it, I'd have to like those kids. But how? Okay, round one. Hey, what Come out fighting. Oh, oh, fight. yeah. All right, now. Yeah, now, 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 calm down. Now, now. Class, today I am going to introduce you 
to a man named William Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, where is he? He's right here in this book in my hand. Well, why should I want to meet him? What's in it for me? Uh huh. That's a very good question. What is your name? Charlie, I believe. Oh, huh? yeah, good, 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 good. Well, you should become acquainted with Mr. Shakespeare. Because as soon as you go back to reform school... I'll go over reform school. I go up to the big joint on my next rap. Well, either way, you're going to have a lot of time on your hands. And Mr. Shakespeare can make it pass very quickly. Hello? Mary, I finally tracked you down. Oh, hello, Frank. I didn't know you were going to live down there, too. Well, see, I found this little uh, apartment. It's uh, convenient to the school. Mary, the neighborhood. Oh, I know. Believe me, I know. But people do live here. Mary, what are you doing? You can't go around asking people, do you know who killed police officer Collins? Yes, I understand. Well, then what are you doing? I don't know. Frank, it's just being here. I mean, I, I could hear something or see something. The department is working on it. You can get her. Oh, Frank. Well, what is it? Well, what's the matter? Frank, I, I... Mary, is something wrong? I can have a cop over there in just a second. No. No, I'm all right. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. What's the matter? You think everybody's deaf? What do you want? Listen, I, I, I live upstairs in apartment 4F. Oh, oh yeah, you're the school teacher. Yes, I, I have to see the superintendent. Uh, honey, down here we don't have no superintendents. We got Janet. I have to see him immediately. Well, you can't do it. Why not? Because he's drunk. <laughs> Look for yourself. <laughs> you see? Sprawled all over the couch. Well, somebody has to do something. About what? There's a rat in my apartment. Only one? <laughs> you're lucky. I just saw him. How do you know it's to him? I was sitting at the telephone and I saw this enormous rat. You sure it wasn't a mouse? Oh, what's going to be done about it? You got a gun? Shoot him. Now, please. Okay. When Strongheart here wakes up, I'll send him to your place. He'll bring up a broom handle or a trap. I don't know what he does. And what am I going to do in the meantime? About what? About the rat. I don't know. Try to make friends with him. Try to make friends with him. Well, the days passed and I couldn't make friends with anybody. In the class, I'd reached a point where I was being tolerated, but just barely. And in the neighborhood, I was obviously alien clay. There was something different about me. My clothes, my accent. I had the look of somebody who didn't have to live there. And that made me suspect... And another thing, I was a teacher. I worked for the government, and the government always meant trouble. There were police, parole officers, and welfare investigators. I was beginning to feel very foolish. How was I ever going to get anywhere in finding Joe's killer? To whom could I talk? Well, hiya, Mary. Well, good morning, Charles. Ah, uh, you saw because I called you Mary. Now, it ain't as if we were in class. Hey, where'd you get the car? I didn't get it. I bought it. I earned the money, and I bought it. Oh, why do you always have to make a lesson out of everything? You're trying to tell me, get a job, Charlie, be a good little boy, work hard, save your money, and one day you'll have enough to yes, buy... Yes, I you... suppose that is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, work is for suckers. There's a quicker, easier way. And the jails are filled with people who took it. Now, listen, Charles, you like this car. Well, I worked... To put the money in the bank. The idea is not to put the dough in the bank, but to take it out. Ah, but you have to deposit it first. No, you don't. Not if you walk in with a gun. But that's stealing. What about all the smooth, dignified, white-haired guys who steal millions and get away with it? Well, if you want to be a crook, why not be the best? Get yourself a good education so you can become one of the smooth, dignified, white-haired boys yourself. What are you, out of your mind? Why? I mean, is your way better? Do you want to spend your life in jail? Or be gunned down? Listen, Mary. What are you doing here? Making a living. Oh, come on, come on. You, you don't have to work here. You're a class dame. What's your angle? Angle? Everybody's got an angle. Unless... Unless what? Unless you like it down here. But then you'd have to be nuts. All right, come on, you guys. All right, a minute. All right, everybody.
everybody, that's it. Uh, now, for tomorrow, we have pages 30 through 45. Uh, well, pages. Oh, what the heck is this? It's so much. Uh, Miss Collins? Yes, yes, Tony, what is it? Uh... Uh, it, it ain't nothing. No, no. It isn't anything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It isn't anything. Uh, I... You have well? Well, uh, like I said, it ain't... Uh, it isn't nothing. Uh, anything. But, uh... I, I want to tell you something. Yes? About Shakespeare. Oh? I used to think, uh... You know, Shakespeare... What gives was Shakespeare, you know? But, uh... All of a sudden... I... I I seen it. I mean, I seen the guys for real. Is that so? Yeah, like you was reading. A and you said, uh, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Remember? Th that's Shakespeare, right? <laughs> yes, it's Hamlet. Yeah, this guy, uh, Polonius says that. But, but, but that's what my old man, he, he should rest in peace. Yeah, that's what, that's what my old man always used to say to me. He'd say, Tony, don't borrow money off in a guy. Don't lend money off in a guy. And you'll be friends with everybody, you see? Yes, I see. This, uh, Polonius, I, I hear what he says. Uh, okay, he knows some fancy words my old man never heard of, but, uh, this Polonius, he's, uh, he's my old man. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, I, I kind of miss the old man, you know? Uh, and now I come across this guy, and, uh, well, uh, w what I want to say is, um, I uh, thanks. Well, I'm sure you're welcome, Tony. Look, uh, if there's something I can do for you, I mean, you name it, is there something I can do for you? How could I ask him? How could I say, do you know who killed Officer Joe Collins? What kind of a question would that be? And where would it lead? And why would he know? But I finally promised that I would call on him if ever I needed help. I don't know how long I'd been sitting there when... Mary. What? Oh, I was walking down the hall. Your classroom door was open. I saw you sitting there. There was something very strange about you. Oh, really? Yes. For the first time since you've come here, I saw you smiling. Oh, I always smile. No, no. This was truly a smile. As if it came from the basic meaning of the word itself, which means to be astonished. What happened? Well, I think I just taught somebody something. And you're starting to get an inkling of the reason why your brother Joe worked down here. Hmm. I think so. Hey, Mary. Oh, hello, Dora. Uh, did you tell your husband about the leaky faucet? Oh, yeah, yeah. He'll get around to it one of these weeks. <laughs> uh, listen... Now, now, tell me if I'm talking out of turn. Uh, are you on the lam? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, you know what I mean, Kit? Do the cops want you? Well, what makes you think the cops want me? Because oh, a cop has been around asking for you, a plain clothes guy. Well, then how did you know he was a cop? Oh, Kit, I can smell him. He's in the hallway now. He is? Well... Thanks. Ah, oh, so you are on the land. I didn't say that. Then what are you going back to your car for? Well, I just remembered. I uh, have a date. Listen, kid. I'm glad to help. Now, before you come back, give me a ring, huh? I'll tell you if the coast is clear. Of course, I knew it was only Frank. But I acted on the spur of the moment, and acted is exactly the right word for it. And Dora spread the word. The implication was that I was sort of hiding out down here. And instantly, my status changed. People no longer stopped talking when I passed by. I was no longer given guarded attention when I walked into a shop. Evidently, now I belonged. But I was getting no closer to my objective. How could I come out with the direct questions? I was becoming a part of the neighborhood, but I still wasn't getting anywhere. Give it up, Mary. Frank, I can't. I've got to get that murder. I know, I know, but it will have to be done in the usual way. And maybe it won't be done at all. That could happen. And the killer goes free, is that right? What am I going to do? Come home to where you belong. No, I belong where I can find Joe's killer. But it hasn't worked. Help me, Frank. 
How? Tell me how I should go about it. I, I don't know what moves to make. There are no moves you can make. I mean, if you were in my place, you are a trained detective, what would you do? Well, I'd have stool pigeons out. We did, you know, but nobody picked up the slightest rumble. Very well, the informer angle has been covered. Then what? Well, the truth is we're doing what you're doing and with no more success. What's got us licked is if we could only get a description, any kind of description, then we could ask definite questions. We could ask, do you know a guy who codes like this or that? But there are no witnesses. What? What did you say, Frank? I said, there are no witnesses. But that isn't true. What isn't true? There was a witness. <laughs> Mary, what are you saying? There was a witness. There was a witness. Was there? I've been following the story very carefully and closely, and I'm not aware of any witness. After all, Joe was killed on a lonely street. No one was there when it happened. Yet Mary says there was a witness. Oh, oh, yes, of course there was. Can you figure out who? It should take you more than a few moments, and by that time, I shall return with Act Three. Joe Collins was killed in the line of duty. He was walking along a deserted street late one rainy night, doing his job, walking his beat. Someone shot him down and fled, and two months have gone by and the police are no nearer to catching the killer than they were the night it happened. Only his sister has discovered the one element that is absolutely vital to the successful capture of the criminal. Or so she says. Mary, there were no witnesses. No one saw it happen. That isn't true. Someone did see it happen. Who? Me. What? I saw it happen. Mary, you weren't there. I didn't say I was there. I said I saw it happen. But how could you possibly... Because I dreamed about it. Oh, Mary. That night you came to my apartment to tell me yourself, remember? I remember. And you will also remember that I knew, I knew it before you even told me. Yes, I remember. Well, how did it happen that I could even tell you where? At the end of Water Street... And remember, you were shocked. Remember, you said, Mary, who told you? At the time, I was upset and nervous. How would I know that it was Water Street? I saw Joe turn that corner. And I saw the man coming out of the window of the warehouse. And I saw that he had a gun. And he fired as soon as he saw my brother. I am the witness because I saw the whole thing. All right, Mary. <laughs> Fine, tell me. What does the killer look like? What? Well, you say you saw the killing. Describe the killer. Is that an unfair question? Oh, no, but I... But what? Well, I didn't get a good look at him. Oh. See, I I was so terrified. And I was so afraid for Joe that I... I and besides, the man was in the shadow. I couldn't see him. Uh, I hate to say this, Mary, but your dream really doesn't do us any good. From a practical point of view, that is. Yes, but next time I'll... Next time I'll concentrate on the killer... Next time? Yes, next time. Tonight. Every night I dream this dream, Frank. Every night. And this time I'm not going to fight it. I'll wait for it gladly. I'll welcome it. And this time I won't look at my brother. I'll look at the killer. <laughs> I tried to look at the man in the shadowy darkness, but I couldn't take my eyes off my brother. And it's in that darkness that the killer exists. And I've got to find him there. I must remember to look there, to look again. You sent for me, John? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was anyone here with you. Hi, Teach. Well, what's the trouble? You'll have to go to the police station and identify your car. Why? 
Well, it seems uh, Charles here and a few of his buddies took your car and went joyriding and then piled it up against a telephone pole. They would have abandoned it except for the fact that a police cruiser happened along. The rest got away. Charles was caught. Oh? Uh-huh. Preliminary estimates on the damage run about $900. Now, oh, what's everybody running a fee for the insurance pays, don't it? That's a great attitude. Oh, I'm glad you like it. This time I'm afraid it's jail. I've given up on you, Charles. Now you're breaking my heart. Oh, why does Charles have to go to jail? Stealing a car is against the law. Who says he stole the car? What? Who says he stole the car? The truth is I gave him permission to use the car. Mary. Mary, it's wrong for you. No, you see, I don't use it very much. And I understand if you don't run a car regularly, you get carbon deposits. Isn't that so? This is not the way to do things. Well, that's the truth. I won't permit it. John, it's the way it happened. Okay. Okay, I'll hold still. But on one condition. This one and his pals... I've got to get jobs and cover the insurance bill. Oh, that sounds reasonable. I know the foreman at Jackson's warehouse. You fellas can all work there after school. And now, if you'll excuse me. Thanks. I, uh... I said you were a class dame. What's been done is done, Charles. And you will have to pay to have it fixed. Oh, listen, me and the guys can steal you a better one. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Listen, you're smart, Charles. Why be a cheap crook? How about becoming one of those smooth, dignified guys? For that, you got to go to college. So? Me? Yes, you. Oh, you got to have rocks in your skull. Me go to college? Why not? Yeah, why not? That's it. Say why not. Say it and keep saying it and say it all the time. And after a while, you won't find a single reason against it. Why are you doing this? Because as a teacher, it's my job to inspire you to get all the education you can handle. And you are bright enough to handle a great deal. Yeah, 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 but... Why'd you get me off that stolen car, Rep? Oh, that? Yeah, I can't figure it. Nobody ever done nothing for me before. I mean, silch, zero, nada. Well, isn't it a better world when people try to help each other? Yeah, sure. All right, what can I do to help you? Someday I might ask you some questions. Questions? Like what? Well, like, would you know a certain person? So ask, what do you want to know? Oh, I don't know yet. But when you find out, you'll ask, won't you? Oh, yes. I'll ask. happened. In the dream, I saw the man. Clearly. For the first time. Not his face. I didn't get the chance. But I saw his body. I saw his body clearly defined in the shadow. He was young. Young even as some of the kids in my own classes. And he was slim. Almost thin. And he was tall. And tomorrow night... Tomorrow night I'll concentrate on his face. Frank, uh, uh, Frank, suppose, suppose I could give you a description of the killer. Well, that'd be great. But where would you get it? Well, every night in my nightmare, I see him more and more clearly. You mean you want a jury to believe that a man you see in a dream is well, the Well, why kill- not? I've seen all the rest of the crime. Can you imagine what a defense attorney would do with you on the stand? Frank, the man I see in the dream is the killer. We'll need more than a dream to convict. Well, maybe you do, but I don't. And what does that mean? Well, that means that I can handle all of it myself. Mary, you're not saying what I think you're saying. The murderer who killed my brother will be dealt with, if not by the law, then by me. Mary! I must sleep. I must fall asleep. Right now. Now, while I'm still calm and relaxed, I need all my energy 
To look into that shadow along the wall of the warehouse, I've got to see his face tonight. I must see his face, the face of the killer. And then I shall hunt him down tonight. Tonight I will see. Joe! Look out, he's got a gun! Look out, Joe! That tall kid with the blonde hair and the scar across his... Oh, my God! It's... Charles, I wonder, could you stay oh, after class for a few minutes? Sure. Yeah, right on, Hey, Pitch. what are you going to stay uh, after, Charlie? Ah, uh, knock it off. Charles, Charles, hmm? Charles. Um, uh, I need some help. Any time. Well, I have to drive out into the country uh, to pick up an antique, and I need someone to... To lift? Carry? Oh, well, I'm your pigeon. Uh, but, uh we're going to get back early. It's just that I got a date. Dad, yeah, who cares? If she don't like it, I can get somebody else. I've always been independent with names. And I'm sure you can afford to be with that blonde hair. And even that scar makes you look handsome. Well, are you ready? Sure. Oh, listen, oh, I'm glad I found you, Mary. You, uh, you have a telephone call in my office. His name is Frank. He said it's of vital importance. Mary. Oh, Mary, you don't know how I prayed for this day. What? What is it, Frank? We got him, Mary. We got him. You got who? Well, who do you think? The killer. The man who murdered your brother. But that's... That's what, Mary? Do you realize what I've just told you? I... We got him. Are, are you sure? It's ice cold. He was arrested in a stick-up at Larson City, just north of here. We checked his gun, and ballistic says it's the same one that fired the slugs that killed Joe. But... But what? To ice the cake, he even confessed. He did? Yes, funny. You know, if we'd only known what he looked like, he would have been a cinch to pick up. If only there'd been a witness. He's tall, thin, long blonde hair, and a funny little scar. Oh, Frank. Frank. What is it? Oh, thank you, Frank. Oh, thank you. Well, I suppose you'll be leaving us now. Leaving you? Why do you say that? Well, I spoke to Lieutenant Miller. He, He told me everything. Oh, And so, now that the killer has been caught, I suppose it's back to North Crescent High for you. I don't know, John. You see, I'm not at all sure that they caught the killer. But they say the man's confessed. Well, they may have caught the man who pulled the trigger, but the killer is still here. The killer is here in these streets. The killer is what you and my brother Joe kept fighting against day and night. The poverty and the hopelessness and the feeling that nobody gives a damn. Hey, Miss Collins, uh, are we going? Oh, no, Charles, no. I, um, I changed my mind. Oh, okay. Uh, but look, anytime I can help. Oh, you've already helped me. Yeah? How? Oh, you'll never know. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you in class tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on in this petty pace from day to day. Ah, uh, Shakespeare. Right, Teach? Right. Tomorrow. That's the greatest gift of all gifts. A tomorrow. And Mary Catherine Collins will make sure of that by working today and every day with the kids that Joe loved so much. How fortunate a man Joe was. All the love and care that he had lavished on his sister returned to all the children. And I shall return with some love and a warning in just a few moments. the dream the extension of reality? Who can say? It was given to Mary to dream of her brother's death. Why? And to see the face of his killer. The true face. Not the visage of a man, but the entire countenance of society. The crucible wherein the killers are formed. 
Here is also a crucible, and we form one of these stories for you seven times a week. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Michael Wager, Bob Caliban, Jack Grimes, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. When it moved, I thought it was a cat. But then it rose straight up before me, and I saw it was Ilse's mother. Monsieur has decided then. Ah, that is well. I am content. Here, give me your hands. My, my hands? But of course, for the dance. We go this night to celebrate. Ilse, Ilse, come to us. Come quickly. And suddenly, Ilse was there. And we joined hands, and we we danced some steps that seemed oddly and horribly familiar to me. Ilza was dressed in rags, as I had seen her before. And then others were there, all dancing. And I heard voices crying, To the Sabbath! To the Sabbath! On to the witch's Sabbath! Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red collars have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Lights out for the devil. And Mr. O. It is later than you think. Turn out your lights. Now, we bring you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. R. Jobler. Some of you may not know this, but beneath many of our cities, there's a subworld, not only of subways, but 
sub-sub basements and man-made caverns where little trains run and deliver the goods to the department stores and the factories of our industrial complex. Today we're going to some of those sub-sub basements in a play I've written for you titled Going Down, all beginning after this top-of-the-world message. Gramercy Park Close of 64 West 23rd Street in New York says, If you think food prices are high, wait till you go out to buy a suit. The price of wool, the devaluation, the union contract, you can get priced out of the market. But you don't have to give up wearing the good clothes you're used to. Just give up the place you've been buying them at. After 78 years of manufacturing men's clothing to sell wholesale, Gramercy Park will show you a new and better way to buy men's clothing. Magnificent suits, coats, sport coats, and slacks. Come up to Gramercy Park's loft on the third floor of the factory building at 64 West 23rd Street. Ask Rosie with the cigar or Flatbush Phil to give you a style show. There's no obligation and credit cards are okay. Gramercy Park is open to 7, Saturday to 6, and on Sunday from 10 to 4. Gramercy Park Close, 64 West 23rd Street, New York. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights now. But of course I can run an elevator. I was just asking. And I told you. Well, here we are. All right. All right, are you getting out? I suppose so. Suppose so. For ten years, that's all I've heard. Where do you work? What do you do? Why don't you let me see you? Don't get angry. Oh, I'm not angry. I'm just telling you. Come on, this way. a big basement. You don't know the half of it. It's like a whole city down here. A person goes to a department store and doesn't know all this is underneath. Say that again. And you're in charge of everything down here? That's another fact. Here. Look at these. What are they? Furnaces? Oil burning. Heat and air conditions, a whole building up above. Twenty stories. Well... Where is everybody? Nothing but a watchman at this hour of the night. Everything's shut down. Help! What's the matter with you? Nothing. What did you do that for? Oh, I... I, I just wanted to hear my voice. It, it, it's like a big cave down here. Yelling <laughs> out like that. Won't you ever grow up? Don't be angry, Arnie. Oh, all right, come on. Yes, Arnie. on in here. Another elevator? Well, you want to see everything, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Down some more? Yeah. All right. Another basement. Yeah. Go ahead. Plenty of light to see behind. What's down here? Come on over here. I'll I'll show you. There, in the wall. Is it a a tunnel? That's what it is. But but a tunnel down here? See those tracks? Oh, yes. Where do they go? How do you think all the merchandise is brought to all the stores here in the business section? Tunnel system, that's how. Right under the city streets. I had no idea. Mighty few people have. Trains run on those tracks, bring the stuff right in. Trains? Oh, Arnie. You think all I've got to do is make jokes? You think the only kind of a train's a big one? Well, I just don't know. These are little ones. They run on electric batteries, just like they have down in the mines. Come on, I'll show you. Where? In the tunnel. But it's so dark. There are lights every little ways. Come on. Ah. Uh. I don't think so. What's the matter with you? I'm afraid. Oh, for John's sake. For years you've pestered me and pestered me to see... You come along, Emma, you understand? All right. Oh, 
morning. The, uh, this is far enough. Oh, for John's sake, what's the matter with you now? I, I don't know. Come on, there's uh, one of the little engines parked down at the end of the tunnel. You might as well see it. Well, keep walking. Uh, I think I'd like down to... Down this way, you'll see the train. Yes, but Arnie, the lights... Honey, where are you? Right here. What's the matter? Matter? Oh, why are you standing so close to me? I'm your husband. Oh, Arnie, don't be silly. Emma, I'm going to tell you something. Honey, what's the matter with Listen you? Listen to me for the last time. Last time? Honey, what's the matter with you? Do you know that you can't get out of here? What? You can't get out of here. Honey, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Oh, oh Arnie. You haven't made a joke like that in years. <laughs> the last time you tried to scare me was right after we were married, remember? With that fur piece you made off was a dead animal that had gotten in the bedroom. <laughs> you remember? I remember. Come along further, Irma. Oh, sure. <laughs> as long as I know what you're up to, I don't mind. How far are we going? A long way. All right, Arnie. Anything you say? Don't I know it. All right. All right? What? This is as far as we're going. Oh, I feel funny. I've never been under the ground so far in so long. It was very nice of you, Arnie, to take me down here. So interesting. Very nice of you. Arnie, why don't you say something? Arnie, is something the matter? Arnie, really, you can't frighten me. Not now, you know. Arnie, are we waiting for someone? If we are, I think I hear him. Hear him? Well, yes, don't you? No. But I heard something. I tell you there's no one down here. All right. All right, if you say so, Arnie. If I say so, if I say so, if I say so, can't you say something else but that even now? Now? Yes. Irma, I'm going... There, I heard it again. What? Are there trains running this late at night? Trains? If it's a train, you ought to get out of here. Tunnel so now, Arnie, please. Shut up. Let me listen. Hear it? Will you shut up? Who's there? Who's there? Isn't there supposed to be anyone? Oh, of course not. I saw to it. Is that you? Is that you, Tom? Who's Tom? Tom, are you down here? One of the watchmen? I told him I'd pull these boxes tonight. I told him. Tom! Hey, Tom! What's wrong? Tom, what's the matter with you? Come on out here. Do you hear me? Come out right away or I'm firing you. Tom! Is, is he playing jokes, too? That fool, I'll break his neck. Get my hands on that. No, Arnie, don't leave me. Arnie, where did you go? Arnie, it's so dark, the tunnel. Arnie, where are you? Oh. Arnold, was that you? Arnold, it is you. Did you cry out? What? Stay back. You? That man? Who... From what's left of his face, I... I think it's Tom. What? What ha... The train ran over him? Arnold, answer me, was it? Train? No. Something's torn out his throat. <gasps> Come on. Gotta get out of here. Oh, yes. Something down here. Arnie! Arnie, wait, I can't police. go so fast. Police, I'll get the police. Please, Arnie, wait for me. Honey, what's the matter? Honey, why are you just standing there? Why don't you open the door? Door wasn't closed before. Well, open it. It, it won't open. It won't open. Leave our 
the devil and Mr. O's story of going down for a word. See? See the leaf? Right here in my hand. Oh, yes. Isn't that a new leaf? Yes, it is a new leaf. Here, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. <laughs> Get it? Leaf? New? What does that mean, to turn over a new leaf? Well, I'm serious. Mm-hmm. Means that you're gonna have a little change. From what to what? From bad to good. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, suppose somebody was crying. They could switch from tears to a smile. Suppose they were lonely. They could go from loneliness to having somebody to play with. Well, suppose somebody wasn't loved. Could they turn over a new leaf? They could go from not loving somebody to loving somebody. How did they do that? All they have to do is try to love somebody. Just try? Yeah. It's easy to love people when you try. Love makes all things new again. Hey, what was that? Another sound of love from the Franciscans. Let's go back to the devil and Mr. O's story of going down. We'll be there in a minute. But are you sure? I tell you, it's an emergency exit. It's always kept open. Why was that so alive? Stop asking me that. I don't know. And that watchman? Stop talking, will you? I don't know anything. I... I... Arnie, why did you stop talking? And why stop? You said the emergency exit. That's it. What? Behind those timbers. (gasps) It's blocked off. You understand? It's blocked off. Well, what do we do? We can't just stand here. Arnold, that man was killed. There's someone down here, I'm afraid. Oh, Arnold, get me out of here. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got to think. Think? Now, whoever killed Tom, not down here necessarily. You don't think so, Arnold? Well, why should he be? Uh, Nothing to steal down here. Tom was always borrowing money from people. Somebody he didn't pay back. Yeah, that's it. But the doors Oh, well, he got out and closed the doors. What of it? We can get out. Come on. Where? I told you, these tunnels lead to the buildings all over the business section. Follow the tunnel to the next sub-basement, to the next building. We'll get out, that's all. Honey, I'm getting too far ahead of me. Oh, well, just walk fast, will you? Oh, honey... I look forward so very much to tonight. It had been so long since you'd even thought about me. I knew that. And tonight, when you called me up and told me to meet you here, and then when you started to play those crazy, scary jokes before, even then I... Then I... Then... Irma, you see it too? under my foot. Arnold, over here, a pile of boxes. Why? Hide behind them. If I help you, could you go over yes, there? Yes, hide, hide. Uh, give me your arm. Yes, I will. Oh, oh my dear. Careful. Hold on to me. If you hold my arm tight, come. Get over there. Come on. I'll help you. Take it easy, That's will it. you? That's it. We're getting there. Back here. There. Oh. Now oh. oh, help me down. Yes. Easy. Here you are. God. Oh, honey. Ah. There. Oh. 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 
Oh, we'll be all right. Oh. Can you... Can you see it? No. No, it's gone. Oh. Just... Just don't, don't think about it, Arnie. you hear me? What was it? Well, you went to school. You studied things like that. That thing. What was it? Irma, didn't you hear me? Yes. I heard you. What was it? What was it? Was, was it a lizard? Yeah, some kind of a lizard. That's it. It was a lizard. Some kind of a lizard. Why do you... Why do you say it that way? I saw it good, Arnie. Well? In school. One of the books, there was an animal like that. How did it get down here? A lizard that big? Oh, no, you... You don't understand. Geology book. The thing wasn't a lizard, exactly. Huh? It was a... Dinosaur. Are you crazy? No. I'm telling you what I saw. It sort of sat up on its hind feet. Just like the picture in the book. What are you trying to do? Make me crazy, too? Why, those things died millions of years ago. Arnie, look. Huh? Way down the tunnel. By the light. <gasps> It's a dinosaur. Don't move. Arnie, it is a dinosaur. Has it gone away? I don't know. It's been so long. Okay. Just don't move. It just looked at us. Yeah. Why doesn't it come after us? Why? Huh? Maybe... Maybe it didn't see us. What? Well, it was... It was like something that, that had been in the dark for a long, long time. Yes. Oh. Don't move around. Oh, there's... There's a little room back here. Oh, would you rather go out there? Oh, don't be angry with me, Ernie. Angry? Why should I be angry? Emma, Emma, you went to school. You studied those things. You, you, you called it a, a, a... Dinosaur. Yeah. All these hours, I, I've been thinking, how could a thing like that, which was supposed to have passed out of the world so many years ago, how could it be alive now? I don't know. Emma, listen, I know... This tunnel under the business district, they, they were putting on an extension, blasting in the rock. Maybe that thing came out from inside the earth. Maybe. You're, you're not frightened, are you? No. Why not? Because I'm with you. If it came back, what could I do for you? It's just being with you. Yeah. I keep thinking. And what? That poor watchman. Yeah. It'll really be something when it's morning and everyone finds out about it. What do you think they'll do? They'll hunt it down. The police will get it soon enough. Arnold. Yeah? Arnold, what if it won't be here then? Huh? It's been hours since we last saw it standing down there. What if it's gone back where it came from? It's all right with me. But what if they're not... They'll hunt it down. They'll find it. Oh. <laughs> Arnold, what's that? It's all right. Everything's all right. But what was... Six o'clock. That was the bell back in the basement. The day engineer turned off one of the sprinkler alarms. Oh. Oh, 
on. Come on. Come on, I'll help you. Oh, yeah. But you said Wait. to do it. Look. Over there. <gasps> back. It's back. Help! 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 It's... It's starting this way. Oh, my leg, Arnie. Oh, how slowly it's moving. As if it... As if we can hardly see. That's it, Anna, that's it. What? It's blind. That thing's blind. It's lived under the earth so long it can't see. But it's still coming this way. Oh, honey, come on. I can't. Hold on to me, Let will you? Let me alone. Go ahead. No, try. I'll carry you. I, you can't carry I me. I will. Go ahead, Emma. Go ahead. I tell I you. Won't go go on. Don't stay here. I tell you. Go oh, on. Honey, please listen to Why me. You stay here with me. I wanted to kill you tonight. You hear me? I brought you down here to kill you. Oh, Arnie, no, you're only I saying you. that. I'm telling you the truth. I brought you down here to kill you. No, Arnie, I'll stay with will you. you. Listen I to me. You. I brought you down here to kill you. Now, that's the truth. Look at me and believe it, because it's the truth. That's why you... That's why I suddenly got so wonderful. I was sick and tired of you. I was sick and tired of living. So I brought you down here to kill you and then kill myself. Arnie. Look. Look at it out there. It's feeling its way along. Well, he'll take care of me, but... You, you've got to get out of here, Irma. No. You've got to get out. I deserve to die, but Irma, not you. You're so blasted good. I guess that's why I got tired of you, but that's no reason for you to die. Irma, stop looking at me like that. You've got to get out. Run straight down the tunnel. Keep running and you'll get away. Irma, just don't look at me. Get going. No, Arnold. Why don't you say what you've always said to me all these years? Just as you say, Arnie. Just as you say... Oh, Irma. Irma, will you get out of here? How slowly it moves. Irma. It is blind. Bless you. Look, will you listen to me? Will you go? You've got to go. They'll think I've killed you. No, they won't. They won't. Yes, they will. I left a note back home for the police. I told them I had killed you. If that thing kills you and me, they'll still think I was the one who did it. Now, do you want me to be a murderer? Do you want that? You left a note? Yes, yes. Don't you remember I turned back after you went out the door on the dining room table? Oh, Irma, get out of here and get that note. Don't make them think I'd kill you, and I... I didn't, and I don't want to. You're such a good... You're, you're too good for me. And I was tired, and I, I was crazy. Don't make me a murderer, Irma. Arnie. Goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, Irma. Yes, hurry. Run fast. Straight ahead. He won't get you, I promise. Arnie. Go. All right. You blind thing, you. Here I am. Here I am. Here. I'm not scared. Come and get me. This is Mr. O. Arch Obler. Let me tell you about a couple of letters I received from you listeners. One of them asked me the question, uh, Mr. O, do you believe in the sensitives who say they can feel the presence of ghosts in the house? I have a quick answer for that one. Unless that so-called sensitive can materialize the ghost for me in broad daylight, now that's the question. Why must the ghost always appear in the dark? As I say, unless the ghost can actually be materialized, I must remain among the skeptics. Extrasensory perception, yes. Ghosts? Show me. The second letter asked me about my new book, House on Fire, and do I truly believe in the existence of devils on Earth? 
Well, it all depends on your definition of the word devil. But I ask you, how else can one explain some of our today's madness? Uh, speaking of devils and deviltry, let's talk about next week's play. The title is one fond to the CPAs and the bookkeepers of the world, Balance Sheet. And let's talk about that after a word from your station. On a sun-parched desert. In a humid, tangled jungle. Beneath the stars of a tropical seaport. These are the places that Hopis are found. Hopis, the people of Project Hope, sail to distant ports on a white hospital ship or take up residence in our own Southwest with this common goal, to help others become medically self-sufficient. Project Hope's mission is not treat and run, it's treat and teach. Hopis teach medical skills to professional counterparts who are eager to learn new methods. And they teach willing workers with limited education the skills that help them contribute to the well-being of their own communities. Help Hope live on. Contribute to Project Hope, Room A, Washington, D.C. This is Mr. O again. I'm with you. I think that happiness is the most important thing in life. There are other people, of course, who live and die by other values, the balance sheet, profit and loss. That's what a very strange play I've written for you takes up next week. Its title, Balance Sheet. It is later than you Dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, you got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shells stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. A Diary of Fate. <laughs> fate plays no favorites. It could happen to you. Book 93, page 860. In the Diary of Fate. Yes, here it is. The name Tyler White. Occupation Confidence Man. Tyler, yours is the infamous profession of swindling people of wealth and social position by first gaining their attention, then their admiration. And finally, their confidence. And you are well suited to your work. You have always been a success. But you have always been dishonest. And now I, fate, move. And because of two little things. A stray dog. 
and a forgotten cigarette lighter, you, Tyler White, soon be executed for a murder you did not commit. But only you and I know that. Take heed, you who listen, lest you think fate is unjust, unmindful of mortal rights. In a moment, another entry under the name Tyler White. And when I have written, I will read from his record in The Diary of Fate. <laughs> The life record of Tyler White now lies open before me. And for a brief moment, I, Faith, look ahead to a single instant of decision. I got it all figured out now. Mm -hmm. Now, Gordon, can you fix an alibi for yourself from 8 to 10 tonight? Sure, sure I can. My boys will swear up and down for me. Good. Now, look. We'll establish separate alibis first, and then we'll get together. And... Take care of Mr. Burke? Right. We're going to take good care of Mr. Johnny Burke. Yes. In the life of Tyler White, the decision was made. But in the last analysis, it was something small. Something beyond the control of this man or any other mortal which determined the inevitable outcome. It is ever thus, little thing. Yes. Yet these are the tools which I, Faith, use. I have no choice. For it is all part of a plan. And once set in motion, nothing, not even I, Faith, can alter the course already ordained. Remember, Tyler, you and your latest victim... The extremely wealthy Mrs. Estelle Courtney were driving to lunch. You were about to close a deal. And so you see, Mrs. Courtney, one man's dream is more than just a good play. Why, it's got everything. It's tender, dynamic. Believe me, you're going to own a Broadway hit. Well, I hope you're right, Tyler. $100,000 is a lot of money, especially for something by an unknown author. Why, none of my friends have ever heard of this Keith, uh, uh, Keith, what's his name? Keith Kennedy. Of course they've never heard of him. This is his first... That's the beauty of it. His work is fresh. His outlook is clean. In short, Mrs. Courtney, it's you talking. Why, Tyler, those were my exact words to young Jim Olson when I hired him this morning. He's from Kansas City, you know, and he's yes. never had any experience of the theater in a big way, like the New York stage, I mean. I showed him that a director's job was the same any place, that he had youth you and a new... You hired this uh, Olsen to direct our play? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. In fact, he left Kansas City this morning. Oh, look, Tyler, Central Park. Isn't it lovely today? Uh, but, Mrs. Courtney, my partner has already picked a director. You can't oh, but hire no, a look at the the now. Look at the blues worn off, no shiny. Oh, please drive slowly while I freshen up a bit. Oh, where well, is that lip? Well, if your mind's made up, I don't suppose there's anything I can do. Do you like the shade? It's called Carnation Red. A really different lip. Oh, Tyler, follow that dog. Look out. Look. I love my lipstick. It's smeared all over my dress. <laughs> yes, Tyler. At just the right moment, I, Faith, intervened. A stray dog darted from the curb, and as you stepped on the brakes, Mrs. put lipstick on her dress. A half hour later, as you left a cleaning shop where the stain had been removed, you were surprised to hear someone call your name as you stepped to the sidewalk. Say, Tyler, Tyler White. Huh? Oh, hello, Burke. Well, I haven't seen you in a long time. How are things going? Can't complain. Uh, we'd better hurry, Mrs. Courtney. It's after one already. Oh, is it 
Hey, well, goodness, I have a day slipped by. Well, so long, Burke. See you around. I uh, don't believe I've had the pleasure. What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, Mrs. Courtney. How do you do, Mr. Burke? Why, Mrs. Courtney, Mrs. Estelle Courtney. Why, yes. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Why, I've seen your picture. I'm and... sorry, fellow. We're in a hurry. The car's over here, Mrs. Courtney. See you, Burke. Yes, I think you will, Tyler. Goodbye, Mrs. Courtney. <laughs> Yes, Tyler. A little thing caused you to stop at a cleaning shop. And as a result, you met Johnny Burke, a man you thoroughly disliked. But you forgot about him an hour later, when Mrs. Courtney finally a contract the next day, awarding you a hundred thousand dollars for the production of One Man's Dream. A play you could stage for $20,000. When you returned to your office and Gordon Kane late, you were elated as you lied to your father. Well, Gordon, we're all set. We've hooked our angel. Are the contract signed yet? No, no, tomorrow. But the $50,000 is as good as ours. 50000 Well, I thought you'd be good for twice that. Listen, Mrs. Courtney isn't easy. As a matter of fact, we're going to lose a few bucks in that deal you arranged with Dwight Reese. You mean she's hired another director? Yeah, some dear boy she met in Kansas City. I'll get it. White and Kane Productions. Tyler. Mr. White, this is Johnny Burke. What do you want, Burke? No reason to be so cold, Tyler. After all, we're old friends. Listen, Burke. I think you're a cheap crook and our friendship ends there. Now, what do you want? Exactly $20,000. What? Are you crazy? Yeah, like a fox. I get this, White. A couple of the big boys. They signed a marker for twenty grand, and it's due and payable tonight. You won't get any sympathy out of me, Burke. I'm not looking for sympathy, Tyler. I'm after cash. You're the softest touch I know. What do you mean by that crack? Business. If you don't have the money out here at my place in Cedarville by 9 o'clock tonight, I may court me, Mrs. Estelle court me, and tell her a few things I know about you and the late Mrs. Goodall. You'll do I'll what? You once, Tyler. I'm in a tight spot. I know how you please Mrs. Goodall. And Mr. White, I've got the letter she wrote to you that prove it. Now, can I... Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there at nine o'clock sharp. Seven o'clock. Tyler, we've been sitting here for three hours. Shut up, Gord. I've got it all figured out now. Can you fix up Pat Alibi for yourself from eight to ten tonight? Sure, sure I can. My boys will tour up and down for me. Good. Now look, here's the setup. We'll establish separate alibis first. And then we'll get together. And take care of Mr. Burke? Right. We'll take good care of Mr. Burke. And no one will suspect us, Gordon. And even if they do, with will do it. Me? Uh, I was with my boys playing cards all day. <laughs> sure. And I was up at a movie. I can prove it. And furthermore, let me tell you... Uh, hello? I'd like to talk to Mr. White, please. It's for you, Tyler. This is Mr. White. Folks, Mr. White. Mrs. Courtney engaged me to direct a play she's backing. Oh, I see. I just got into town. I'd like to get together with you and Mr. Kane. Oh, I sure, but it's it's after seven already, Mr. Olson. And, well, then, uh, uh, how about dinner? Dinner? No, I'm afraid that's impossible. I'm going to be busy tonight. Very busy. No, Tyler. You had no time for dinner with Jim Olson that night. You and your partner had no time for anything except the murder of Johnny Burke. Shortly before 8 o'clock, you left Gordon in the office. He was calling the right people to establish his alibi. And you went to the Fairfield, a moving picture theater you had visited the night before. You were careful to be conspicuous. You talked to the girl in the box office. Uh, in other words, if I just catch the start of the feature, is that it, honey? That's right. The name isn't Honey, if you don't mind. <laughs> it should be. 
Look, mister, the whole show was on the inside. The feature starts at 8.6 and breaks at 10.30. Now, how many, please? One. I, uh, I'm sorry about that funny business. Fresh funny. Well, forget it. But the name's June. White, my name's June. Tyler White. I'm glad to know you. Yes. You know her, Tyler, because it strengthened your alibi. And as you entered the theater, you joked with the man who took your ticket. Then you talked to the manager who stood nearby. And finally, I usher seated you. A moment later, un- you quietly moved to a side exit and left. And even as you stepped into the darkened alley and walked quickly toward the rendezvous that you and your partner had arranged, Gordon Kane left the office. Everything was timed perfectly, Tyler. But then I, fate, moved again. And unknown to you, another little thing happened. As Gordon Kane reached the end of the corridor, he took out a cigarette, then discovered that he had forgotten his life. Quick, back to the office. Hello, Kane speaking. Oh, Mr. Kane, this is Mrs. Courtney. Is Mr. White there? Why, no, he's not. Mrs. Courtney? Well, I thought so. It's about the contract I'm going to sign tomorrow. Uh, tell me, is that $100,000 due in a dump sum? What? Uh, Mr. Kane, I asked you if that $100,000 is due in a dump sum. Well, hey, I... Courtney... I'll have to ask Mr. Tyler. Yes. A forgotten cigarette lighter. And Gordon King learned that you, Tyler, had lied to him. Soon now you will meet your partner. And soon fate will make a further entry under your name. When I have written, I will read from the record in... The Diary of Faith. Because of a little thing, a stray dog that darted from the curb, you, Tyler White, became the victim of a blackmailer, a man as evil as yourself. Another little thing, a forgotten cigarette lighter, your partner, Gordon Kane, learned that you were even dishonest with him. But he said nothing when you met and drove to Cedarville where Johnny Burke lived. The house was dimly lighted. Street. And you, Tyler, were uncomfortable as you rang the doorbell and waited. But there was no answer. You were surprised when you tried the door and found it unlocked. We may be walking into a trap. That doesn't add up. Burke needs money, remember? Burke. Burke, are you home? I don't like this, Tyler. Let's get out of here. Oh, relax, Gordon. Relax. Sit down. Burke probably stepped out for a minute. Well, maybe you're right. Tyler, look. Under that cushion, it's a gun. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do with it, Tyler? I, I think I'll put it in the desk here just in case Johnny Burke has any fancy ideas. Hey, where are you going? This place is a back door. I want to know, but... Tyler. Yeah. Tyler, come here. What? What's the matter, Gordon? What is it? Mr. Burke is home after all. What? He's dead. Yes, Tyler. 
the man you and Gordon Kane had intended to murder was already dead. For a moment you stared in cold fascination at the body face down at your feet. Then you noticed the letters, the ones you wanted so badly. Look, Gordon, on the desk, the letters. Yeah, I guess he was going through them when he was killed. Who do you figure did it? Any one of a dozen. Burke was a dirty blackmailer and a stool pigeon. And believe me, he murdered more than... Tyler. Yeah, yeah, come on. Grab those letters, Gordon. Let's go. The back door. Come on. But can't you go any faster, Tyler? My foot's on the floor now. Now, quick worry. In another half hour, we'll be back in town. And you'll be playing... Tyler. Oh, man, what's up? Put out your lights. He's over here in this ditch. He's dead. Not yet. Bleeding bad. I guess he was fixing a flat when you hit him. What do we do? Let's get out of here. We'll leave him. But Tyler, Close we can't... your head, Gordon. If we report this and get an ambulance, we're spotted in the seat of him. Come on, let's go. <laughs> You'd better let me out here, Tyler. It's only a block to my place. Yeah, you're right. Can't be too careful now. Well, so far. So... I'll see you in the morning, Tyler, at the office. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Those letters. Let me have them. No, Tyler. I don't think I will. What? Is this your idea of a joke, Gordon? Yeah, it's a joke, Tyler. Like the one about you getting only $50,000 from Mrs. Courtney. What? What are you talking about? Tyler, Mrs. Courtney called at the office tonight and wanted to know if the $100,000 was to be in a lump sum. Listen, Gordon, you're getting just what you're worth. Now give me those letters. Give them to me. Get your hands off me. Tyler, put down that ring. Now I'll have those letters, Gordon. Gordon! Gordon! Now, Tyler, you had murdered. Thought horrified you, and your mind reeled in utter confusion. But in a moment you gained control of yourself and realized that now both Burke and Gordon were out of the way. And you had your precious letter. Quickly, you stripped Gordon of his wallet. Watch. A ring. Then, unnoticed, you drove hurriedly to the Fairfield Theater. At half past ten, you stepped from the shadows of a nearby shop and approached the girl in the box office confident that your alibi was still unshatterable. That's right, sir. The last picture goes on in ten minutes. You're welcome. How many, please? Uh, two dozen, honey. All on the aisle. Two dozen? Oh, 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 it's you again. Hello. <laughs> the name's still Tyler White, uh, June. Oh, I haven't forgotten. The fact that I'm thinking about you. Wondering if I was going to stop by on my way out? Well, sort of. <laughs> you see, I'm through here in a half hour. Look, you and I have uh, got to get home for a minute. Uh, business call. But how about me picking you up when you're through, you hmm? Well, I, I shouldn't, but uh, we're all right. It's a day. And then I'll uh, see you around 11, hmm? <laughs> We'd been in the theater from 8 o'clock until half past 10. We talked to the ticket taker, to the manager. You had even made a date with a girl who would not forget your name. And on your way home, you stopped on a nearly deserted bridge and got rid of the things you had taken from Gordon's body. Now as you approached your lead, until a voice from the darkness called your name. Hey, Mr. White. Huh? Oh, 
Who's there? Who is it? Name's Barton. Lieutenant Barton, homicide. Homicide? What? Yeah. What? Well, what's the trouble, Lieutenant? The usual thing. He's dead. Mind if I come in? No, 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 of course not. Good. Chilly tonight. But, uh, what do you want with me? Who's dead? Your partner, Gordon Kane. Gordon? Is dead? I, yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah, must be a shock to you, all right. Tell me, where you been tonight? Me? Why, I've been at a movie at uh-huh. the Fairfield. Been there since uh, 8 o'clock. Yeah. Can you prove it? Of course I can. Wait a minute, though. Surely you don't think I killed Gordon Kane? So why I don't. That looks like a run-of-the-mill stick-up slam. Well, then, uh, why this questioning? Uh-huh. Because you're under arrest for murder, White. For the murder of Johnny Burke. What? Burke? Yeah. Johnny Burke's dead, too? Uh-huh. The 38. Mm. We found a gun in the desk drawer in the living room. And that the fingerprints on it are yours. Get through, White. You're a but, dead duck. But why would I kill Burke? That's easy. Blackmail. Let's see, we found a letter. Written. Good owl. It was under Burke's body. But I... I told you I was at the Fairfield Theater from 8 until 10 o'clock tonight. Uh-huh. Maybe you was. Johnny Burke was killed at 7 o'clock. Where was you then, Mr. White? At 7? I... Well, I, I was in my office. Oh. Gordon Kane, we were, we're talking business. Ah, but Gordon Kane's dead, remember? It says your alibi. No, 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 wait. Huh? I can prove I was there. I, I, I had a call from uh, Jim Olson, a director who just got into town. Huh? He called me. Yeah, yeah, I can prove that, Lieutenant. I'm sure I can. <laughs> Yes, you were safe, Tyler. You had an alibi. A witness who could break the chain of circumstances that was closing tightly about you. A chain that could hold you for a murder you did not. But soon, Tyler White, you will learn that the supreme law of justice is as constant as the rise and fall of the tides. Or soon... I will write the final entry under your name in The Diary of Fate. Tyler White, you were no longer afraid as you stood before Lieutenant Barton, an officer who had convincing circumstantial evidence that you had work, a crime of which you were innocent. Your confidence gradually returned as you called Mrs. Courtney and heard her say where you could locate Jim Olson, the one man who could keep you from arrest and trial for murder. Tyler. Uh, Jim Olson is staying at the Royal Arms Hotel. I, uh, I think I have a number right here. Yes, yes, it's Drexel 27331. Drexel 27331. Thank you, Mrs. Courtney. Thank you very much. Well, Lieutenant Olson is at the Royal Arms Hotel. The number is Drexel 27331. Okay, I'll call him. Hotel. I'd like to speak to Mr. Olson, Mr. Jim Olson. I'm sorry, sir, but Mr. Olson... Hey, look, this is the police. Lieutenant Barton, homicide. Now, is Mr. Olson there? No, Lieutenant, he's not. You see, Mr. Olson was killed tonight. Huh? What? What's that? He was killed? By a hit-and-run driver. It happened just outside of Cedarville. <laughs> yes. 
The man Tyler hit in the road and left to die was the only man who could prove he was not guilty of the murder of Johnny Burke. Now as Tyler White sits in prison and awaits his execution for a crime he did not commit, he realizes that justice will be served. And now it is time to close the book. Another has been carefully noted on the pages of eternity. In the case of Tyler White, as in the cases of all mortals, I, fate, am but an instrument of the plan, and the little things at my command with which I work. Because of a stray dog, Tyler White, a dishonest man, was led to his death after he had killed the one man who could have saved him. Ponder well, listen and remember, there is a page for you in The Diary of Faith. <laughs> The cast included Herbert Lytton, Ruth Parrott, Herbert Rawlinson, Bob Lowry, Tyler McVeigh, Ivan Dittmars, and Hal Sawyer. Diary of Fate is a Larry Finley transcription, brought to you from Hollywood. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Wheaties present Dimension X. Adventures in Time and Space, transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension X. On stage tonight, Dimension X, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. I don't mean to be too personal, mind you, but have you found out how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11? It's really very easy to find out, you know, and it's mighty worthwhile. Now, what you do is this. Come breakfast time some morning real soon. Dish yourself up a bowl of Wheaties. Crisp golden flakes, 100% whole wheat. Add some fruit, add milk, and you'll be getting some real nourishment. And at 11 a.m., I think you'll begin to understand why. Because Wheaties have it. The whole wheat energy that makes such a difference come mid-morning. Wheaties have it. And it's for you. Now, see if you don't look better, feel better, smile easier every day that breakfast begins with Wheaties. I know. I do. See for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. It's amazing, really. Do you remember when you were young... How your elders would tell you bedtime stories about the man in the moon. Well, tonight we have a different kind of story to tell about him. A story of suspense in the unknown world of the future where anything can happen. Attention. Attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention. This is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smidgley, Jonathan, 
five feet eight inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, get off this wavelength. This is a restricted band. Hello, uh, hello. Uh, Look, whoever you are, you're on a coded wavelength. Now tune out. This frequency is reserved for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This is the moon calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy's loony. Transmitting room. Jake in transmission. Uh, Jake, this is Charlie in the code room. Some crackpots on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. I've got CQ trying to trace it now. Yeah, well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham's in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. They ought to take his license away. Oh, here comes Lenny with a directional fix. Here you are, Jake. I checked it four times. What? Well, this is impossible, and you know it. I can't help it. Hey, That's what's what I... going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycle. Listen, Charlie. That interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Oh, yes, there is, Charlie. Straight up. Straight up. Hey, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal's coming from the moon. The moon? Are you nuts? Somebody might be bouncing it like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where did you study basic radio? Uh, listen, flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Now take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. <laughs> Mr. Timken, Mr. Timken. What's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Now, listen, Mr. Timken, you know I'm a sober citizen, right? Never once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, Hello. right? In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I What's once... What's the matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. Well, that's got it. Started on voice and switched to Morse. What did he say? Uh, let's see now. Uh, can you read me? Help Otterburn. We'll contact when the moon is in phase. Otterburn. Uh, sounds like a name. Otterburn. Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? To talk to the chief. Hey, now, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I'm going to tell him, Charlie. What? Oh, no. This is too much for me. <laughs> Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on the city desk. Huh? One moment. O'Brien speaking. Uh, Seamus? Yeah? Uh, this is Charlie Starbuck down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This'll cost you a beer, okay? Shoot, Buck. I'll stay in your wavelength for 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. From the... What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus. If you don't know a story when you see one. I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. Dad. So long, Orson Welles. Where... Orson Welles? Hey, how do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist. Reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945. Uh, just five years ago. Vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. This is some crackpot trying to jam the airway. But, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So are a lot of names. But, Mr. Wade, I have a theory. Henry, you always have a theory. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Mr. Wade... Out. I... I'm busy. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Henry. Oh, uh, here, take this folder of reports for the death file. Oh, oh yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing person reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau, but, uh, no more nonsense, hmm? No, sir, Chief. No more nonsense. Oh! Uh, pardon me. Hmm? Are you Mr. Henry Timken? Uh, that's my name. Permit me, Jefferson Philo. Scientific feature writer. 
May I have a moment of your time? Certainly. Uh, just sit down at my desk right over here. Thank you. My, that's quite a stack of papers. Filing. Filing. I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. Now, Mr. Timken. Uh, yes? Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon? Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It may be a bounce. Uh, they have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, uh, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Oh, really? Well, I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my briefcase. Well, uh, don't bother. Oh, but I insist. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Well, thank you very much. Now, about this message from the moon, Mr. Timken. Well, we don't know for sure, as I said. But I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburst. The physicist? Oh, you know him. I once wrote an article on his contribution to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn, years ahead of his contemporaries. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, uh, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Uh, uh, look here, Mr. Philo. If you will come here tomorrow night at eight, we may learn the answer to that question. I have arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. Until tomorrow night, then. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Philo. Goodbye. Ha, 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 ha. Now, let me see now. Uh, well, that's funny. Where did this list of names come from? Paul Ahrens, astromathematician. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Carl Parker, mining specialist. Oh, this must have got mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. It's a peculiar list of names. Most peculiar. Uh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Tipkin. I uh, see we made the papers. Oh? And how? <laughs> Mr. Chief steamed up about it. Well, what did the paper say? Uh, mostly ha-ha. Here's the Herald. Oh? Oh, brother, what a panic. Uh-huh. Oh, dear. Oh, my. <laughs> no wonder Mr. Waiter's hopping. Uh, oh, uh, about tonight, Mr. Tilkin. I don't now, know. you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room, Charlie. Yeah, but I didn't expect this. Listen, Charlie, we've got to find out if there's something to that message. If Otterburn is alive somewhere and radioing for help... Uh -oh, it is hold it, hold it. Time for the morning broadcast. We've got quite a lift today. Well, do you mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Oh, I ain't self-conscious. Stick around. Attention. Attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's, Dr. Paul, five feet five... Brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin. Aaron. Thick glasses. Occupation, astro-mathematician. Missing since 6 o'clock this morning. Uh, Being missing? sought by Bel Air police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat, Dr. Paul Aaron. Charlie, shut it off this... a second. Oh, no, listen, Mr. Timken. It's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt. This is important. Now, what time was Dr. Aaron's reported missing? Uh... 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. Are you certain, Charlie? Yeah, positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh, let's see. Uh, Simons, Robert. What? Engineer. Came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? What's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. Uh, nothing, Charlie. Except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk, and that list included the names of those two men who weren't reported missing until an hour ago. What? Yeah, that don't sound right to me. It isn't right, Charlie. Which raises a question. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? <laughs> Dimension X will continue in just a moment. You know, friends, when I talk about Wheaties' Breakfast of Champions, I mean something like this. 
Champions do eat Wheaties because they feel Wheaties give them energy they need and because they just plain like the way Wheaties taste. And even though they are champions, that isn't unusual. Sort of the way you and I look at it, isn't it? Here's Ed Prentice with a perfect illustration of my meaning. Now, young man, will you tell us what you do for a living? I pitch. You what? Pitch, pitch. You know, baseball. When you have a baseball team, you have to have a pitcher. I'm a pitcher. I pitch. Oh, yes, yes, I see. And are you on a team? Uh, yes, sir. I'm on the Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Indians, hmm? What is your name, young man? I'm Bob Feller, and you know it as well as I do, Ed. Sure I do, Bob. It's good to see you. This makes your 14th season playing with the Indians, doesn't it? Yep, yeah, Ed. 14 years. Well, tell me, Bob, how long have you been eating Wheaties? Oh, about 20 years, give or take a couple. You mean you started eating Wheaties before you started playing ball? Oh, I, of course. What's so strange about that? Most people start eating Wheaties before they get to playing ball. In fact, most people never start playing baseball. You don't have to be a ball player to enjoy the lift you get from Wheaties with milk and fruit. You're right as rain, Bob. No champ ever said a truer word about Wheaties. Breakfast of Champions. And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Uh, a science feature writer. I see. Uh, you were the leak on the story, then? Oh, Oh, yes, sir. I'm afraid I was. Uh, I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing stock. Uh, well, we'll deal with that later. Uh, what's uh, this Philo like? Well, he's strange. B bald, thick glasses, tall. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but being a science writer... Is there any other possibility? I don't know. But I do believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That sir. seems like a very remote possibility. A missing persons bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. Henry, I do not require a statement of policy. What's the theory? Mr. Wade, <clears throat> I have discovered that each year literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And... They disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, uh, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases, then scientists... What do you think and... happens, Henry? Well, I don't know, Mr. Wade. But I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon. Even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Philo? I don't know, but I would like to find out. And you think Audubon may be a part of this picture? I definitely do, Mr. Wade. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like that? It's more than an idea. The two top men on this list are missing. Maybe so, <laughs> but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Well, if I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, sir, but and if look, you, don't, you think I'm going to make myself a laughing stock by putting any belief in such a crack brain theory? Well, admit... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes? Yes, I see. Uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Henry, let me see that list again. Oh, yes, sir. Okay, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I, uh, guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Yeah, sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. A uh, Parker? The third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry, perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you really stumble onto something. Uh, what do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. I'll uh, join you. Uh, <clears throat> I also invited Mr. Philo, the science feature writer. Well, I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in your... Mr. Philo. Mr. Wade, you don't think... That he's mixed up in this? I don't know, Henry. Well, Mr. Wade, let, let's contact the police. No, Henry, I think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. I don't want the police laughing at the Bureau if you're wrong. I don't know, Mr. Wade. Besides, I... there may be more danger than you realize. Let's keep it quiet. Shall we, Henry? Yes, sir. I... 
didn't realize there was any danger. Eight o'clock. Friend Mr. Filer was late. He said he'd be here, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. You can't wait much longer. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Filer when he comes. Are you getting anything? No. Well, just some foreign stuff. Programming from Johannesburg, South Africa. Are you going to in Africa? Oh, no, dear me. That's a very peculiar transmission sound. That sounds like something. See if I can work a selector here. The moon is in phase. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, uh, hello. Do you hear me? I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterberg. Hello. Uh, go on. Go on. I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. Do you hear me? Go ahead. Keep talking. I have only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Good Lord. Start that recorder, Mr. Wade. Go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Closely. There's an Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon. Made up of renegade scientists and criminals. Professor Ernst Holtzman. Holtzman? He died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Holtzman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escape inmates of the asylum. They took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Go ahead. We're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists from Earth. Slave labor, mostly. Some women, scientists. The oxygen problem is a big one. I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, we know. Keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive with their flying disc. Hello? Uh, we're still getting you. Go on, go on. Uh, speak louder. We pulled what little oxygen we had. The others, dead now. They got arrested. you. You've got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony, planning to take over the Earth. Listen, they have agents on Earth. Hear me? Agents on Earth? Well, where? Who? Hello? Hello? Agents in... Henry, look out. There's the light. Someone at the window. Get back. Henry, are you all right? I, I... I think so. Oh, his shot smashed the transmitter. Strike a match. Careful. Whew, that was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. Well, we got a recording anyway, but not the most important part of the message. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo's probably one of them. He'd be looking for you now, trying to kill you. The police, Mr. You think Wade. the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? Henry, believe me, they'd clap us into straitjackets before we could finish. We've got to do something. We need time. Time to get proof. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. We can only figure some way. Wait, I know. How? Listen. There's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. My car is there. Mr. Wade, let's By the call time the, the police. police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Here's the car. All right, Henry. You open the garage door, then jump into the car. We make a dash for it. But where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private, miles from the nearest neighbor, and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead, start the door. All right, Mr. Wade. Quick, jump in. Yes, sir. All right, here we go. Cross your fingers, Henry. I read it out all right. Anything doing? Well, there's a blue coupe behind us. It uh, seems to be following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue and out Route 1 toward Baltimore. It 
It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. He... He's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes, sir. Why did you stop? Turn off the lights, quick. It worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I think everything is going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. This place is really out in the wilderness, Mr. Wade. You can stay here indefinitely until we figure out the next move. Just up this dirt road now, there's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down in a hollow where it can't be seen except from the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. It'll hide you out there. Well, we can leave the car here. We'll leave it the sink. Come on. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. Came up here to get away from it all. There's the silo. Well, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Yes, sir. Oh, careful of those bushes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, that Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's pitch dark. Hold my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up, then another door. Yes, sir. Steel. This is an unusual silo. Double walls, wood outside, steel inside. Completely fire. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. You're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Well, uh, don't be long, Mr. Wade. The, this place gives me the willies. I'll just be a moment. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wade. Uh, uh, Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade! What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It's locked. Oh, no. Oh, this, this must be a light switch. Oh, thank God. No, oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20 of them. Mr. Wade! Help! Help! We'll do you no good to shout, Henry. M M Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside, speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. Fifteen or twenty of them. They're, they're sitting like statues just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. Yes, but, but who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry. Since they're currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astromathematician. Ahrens? Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list? Yes. They've all been recruited for work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. On the moon? Then you, 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 you're one of them? Of course. You'll turn around, Henry. You'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. Philo? But I, I thought... I, that he was I, part I, of the conspiracy? No, on the contrary. His stooping made it necessary for me to include him. Yes, but the man in the window, the one who fired the shots. An agent of mine, the pilot of the ship. Ship? What, what, what ship? This silo is a camouflage for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A, a rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companion will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you, 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 you can't do this to me. We have done it, Henry. No! You see, there was another name omitted from that list, which no. I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage. No, I, I won't let you do this. You can't. Please, 
Attention. Attention. Missing since 8 o'clock last night, the following persons. Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, brown eyes, slightly balding. Tonight, Dimension X has presented The Man in the Moon, an original story by George Lefferts. Featured players were Louis Van Ruten as Henry Timpkin and Santos Ortega as Wade. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's show. And now, here is your Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Everybody knows whole wheat has vitamins and minerals in quantities. Sure, no great trouble figuring that out. The trick is in making the whole wheat into crisp, toasty flakes like Wheaties, with all the good whole wheat things still in them, and with all the good, natural whole wheat taste. Well, do you know how the Wheaties people do it? Well, I'll tell you. It's simple. They use a whole kernel of wheat to make one Wheaties flake. You see? No wonder Wheaties are good for you. And you know how good they taste. Crisp, sweet as a nut, simply wonderful. How can you stand missing them, if you are missing them? when they're all that good, and all that good for you. Why don't you breakfast up to Wheaties tomorrow morning, huh? And see for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Breakfast of champions. Yes, yes. Next week, a strange and thrilling story of the foreign underground, of a brilliant young scientist and his wife whose only chance for escape from the secret police lay in a world that is beyond infinity, the world of... Dimension X. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Holy cow! Look at the floor! Coming to life, flowing over Thunder's body. It's covering him completely. Here comes Monk Mayfair, the ape like chemist. Gracious. Ham Brooks, the sword-wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two-fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. I'll be super amalgamated! And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, The Crawling Terror. 
Chapter 7 of the fantastic story, Fear Key. Doc Savage and his crew on the remote Caribbean island of Fear Key have been captured by the evil Santini and his Fountain of Youth gang. The gang has also apprehended old Dan Thunden, the man who claims to be 131 years old and holds the secret to the whereabouts of the fabulous substance Santini seeks a substance wealthy men throughout the world are willing to pay $1 million each to obtain. Still, a mystery is the source of the fearful presence that instantly turns men into skeletons. Doc, his five aides, Pat Savage, and Kel Avery and her bodyguard, DeClima, sit securely bound in the underground caverns of Fear Key as Santini gloats over his captives. This is the joyful occasion for me. This is what I wait for. Not only do I have this fabulous Doc Savage a prisoner, so he will not interfere with my search for the weeds, but I also have the old Dan Thunder who can tell me where the weeds are. If he ever does. Oh, he will, senor. That I cannot guarantee you. Take the old man somewhere and make him answer our questions. And be sure not to go near that door with the secret lock. We do not want our friends here to turn into skeletons. At least. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> that don't sound good, Doc. Silence! Perhaps it is the best to separate you so you do not foil anything. Short, leaky. Take a savage and the Avery girl to another cave and watch the bronze man closely. If he does anything the least suspicious, shoot him. You're right, boys. Sure hope Doc has some plan to get us out of this. I don't see what Doc can do. They searched him and he tied up with so much rope, he looks like a mummy. Losing faith in Doc? <sighs> Brother, he's the only hope we've got. Monkey, this guy weighs a ton. Hang down, Shorty. Where are we taking me to? Just around the corner of that little cave. You see, a cave's only got one entrance. It'll be a good place to keep a watch on it. Okay, you guys can beat it. Shorty and me will watch these two. Can we keep the lanterns on them? Nix. Santini says the bronze guy can hypnotize you with his eyes. Now, I ain't taking no chances. Point the lanterns past them. And then we'll keep watch over by the corner so he can't jump us. Take them long to discover the trick. What trick? That Santini didn't really call them. But I heard... That was merely a little bit of ventriloquism. But it sounded just like him. No time. Unzip my boots. Unzip... Oh, I see. Your boots don't have lace? Yes. Slide around so you can unzip them. I'll try. Can you reach them? I think so. There. Good. Let me kick them off. Your socks? The ends of them are missing. Yes. Straps around my instep keep them on while my toes are left uncovered in such emergencies as this. Now, get out of the way. I'm going to double over and try to untie the ropes. With your toes? Of course. <clears throat> I'd stop with everything else. You're a contortionist. Comes in handy sometimes. <clears throat> there. Now, quickly. I'll untie enough of your rope so you can get free. Then meet me down the corridor quietly. I've got to get those two men before they discover my trick. All right. Hey, Leaky. The ball thing here. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, boss. Where'd you go? I hope your head is still hard. Oh. oh. Uh, Mr. Savage, what happened to them? They won't be out long. Come on, Miss Avery. Back to the main cavern. Are we going to rescue your men? Not yet. An attempt to free them would surely mean a fight. That would be noise and an alarm. First, I want to find Dan Thunder. Here's the main cave. Yes. Everyone's still here, including Pat and your bodyguard, the cleaner. And a number of Santini's men are watching them. They took Dan Thunder off that way. Yes. We can slip by without being seen. Quiet now. Oh! Oh, 
That sounds like Mr. Sun. It came from that direction. Let's take a look. My God! And he's torturing him, tearing out his fingernails. That is all of the fingernails, Senora Thompson. Shall we try an eye next? No, not that. What do you want to know? I suppose you have no idea. Oh. All right, Santini. The Ouija in a secret storeroom. Just the other side of the wooden door. What? You mean that we have to take a chance with, with those... Oh, with my little friend, yes. <laughs> and I do hope you have an accident. How do we get into the storeroom? Can you walk on still? No, then I don't give a who I you. How is this storeroom a door open? There's a black lid in the rock. You damn your weight against that. Very well. But shall I get some of my men, and we shall try it. Watch him closely. I shall return in a moment. Mr. Savage, are you going to rescue Sunday? No, Miss Avery, he's safe for the moment. But I want to get to that storeroom before Santini does. Come on. Santini seemed nervous about going into the storeroom. Are you sure we should try it? We must. But whatever it is that turns men to skeletons must be in there. There is that possibility. We'll have to see that when we get there. Well, there's a bit of luck. What? There on the floor. Monk's knapsack. He must have dropped it here when they were captured. How do you know it's Monk? His compact portable laboratory inside makes its shape very distinctive. It also furnishes us with the chemicals and apparatus we need. Need for what? No time for that now. The storeroom is just around the bend. Come on. Here we are. Now what? Wait. Let me listen at the door. No sound. Let me try the secret catch. It's dark as pitch in there. Monk has a flashlight in his knapsack. There's the black ledge. Sundin said to push against it. Yes, but he's rigged a lot of booby traps on this island. I want to find something to... Someone's coming. Quick, into that ditch in the wall. We won't be seen there. He came to it quite quickly. He's going to the Black Ledge. Yes. He obviously overheard Thundam talking, and he's decided to double-cross Santini. He's throwing his weight against the ledge. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, oh, my God! He was cut in half! Stay here. Very clever. A razor-sharp cleaver, roughly fashioned from the iron part of a sailing ship... Rigged on a hardwood arm that splashes out of some pressure is placed upon the stone. Oh. Come, Miss Avery. The secret to this mystery lies inside the storeroom. We must go on. Very well. Yes. Here it is. In all the earth and her jars lining these shelves. But what is it? I'll open some. Leaves. Dried and carefully packed. They almost look like tea. But not quite. What are you doing? Sprinkling a bit of chemical from Monk's knapsack on the leaves. Someone's coming. Quick, back into that niche. Wait. The door is open. Someone has a brain here. What? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Do you not recognize the decapitated form on the floor, my dear Shorty? It is a leaky. He's tried to pull the truth of the deal on us just like a damn Thunder. And now leaking is a fall into one of Thunder's traps. <laughs> How beautiful! <laughs> is this it? Oh, let us see. See, this is it. At last, we have the material, and there is nothing here to make us all rich men. Oh, uh, see, you're going to keep your promise, ain't you? Back on Long Island, you said we'd all get some of the wheat when we found the storeroom. Remember? Uh, see, I said it. And then later, you can all... Know. What sample of stuff? It's supposed to make a guy feel better right off, ain't it? It is. So, what's wrong with trying it now? Yeah, yeah. Very well. 
We shall try it at once. It must be mixed with water. We will take it back to the main cave and mix up a batch for all of us. Yes. What? The stuff that makes you live forever. The real fountain of youth. Hey, Hanson. You got me so roped up I can hardly breathe. How about loosening me up a little, huh? Eh? No chance. You didn't think he really would, did you? You missing late. Listen, you fashion plate. If I ever get out of this... Shut up, you two. We have found it. Buena. We shall all live forever, my men. And we will sell enough of this stuff to make us all millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> now come. We shall retire to Dan Condon's old living quarters and partake of our pleasure. Come, all of you. I don't get this at all. Do you hear what they said? They're, they're the crazy dogs going to think they found something that'll give them everlasting life. Wait a minute. I get it now. Fountain of Youth Incorporated. Remember the Fountain of Youth that Ponce de Leon hunted for? It was supposed to be somewhere in Florida. You got as crazy as they are. The Fountain of Youth could be on this key. Maybe long ago the reef was passable. Canoes came here. The Fountain of Youth might not have been a fountain at all. But that funny-looking weed Santini had. Maybe that plant does bring everlasting life. Nuts. Ham is imminently correct, Monk. Huh? Remember the wreckage we found that bore a pronounced resemblance to structural segments from an ancient Roman galley? Has that got something to do with this, John? It has emphatically. That wrecked galley was the clue that made me think of a legend from history which explains the presence of this weed that brings everlasting life, supposedly. I still say it's holy. Ever hear of C. Rene? Oh. C-I-R-E-N-E. C. Rene. Wasn't that a city that grew up about the time of old Egypt and Carthage? Indeed, man. C. Rene stood on a plateau. Its source of wealth was a fabulous medicinal herb known as silphy. Even the coins of C. Rene bore a design of the ruler watching the subjects weighing the remarkable plant. I remember. Legend gives the herb great powers, claiming it cured every ailment, wounds, even disease. Correct, Ham. Ships came from all over the world for the herb, and it became extremely high-priced. Eventually, the Romans took over C. Rene and put an enormous tax on silver. The people of Cyrene were enraged and set about to destroy the herb to rid themselves of the high taxes. In time, Sophium became extinct. I don't believe it. It's in the history books, damn it. Men have searched for years for sprigs of the planet. Wait a minute. Only a year or two ago, there was a newspaper story about an Italian doctor who thought he'd discovered some Sophium again in Cyrenetica. Right. It's foolish to think that the people of ancient Cyrene would destroy so valuable a planet. So perhaps they loaded some on a galley and sent it off to an island or another part of the coast. And just suppose that galley got lost and eventually would wind up here on Fear Key. Sounds possible. Maybe, but still. Come on, woman. Take him. Where are you taking the clean up? None of your business. Come on, you guys. All in out of here. Well, looks like they're going to stop knocking us off one at a time. Poor the Klima. Don't worry too much about the Klima. Ah! And the Savory. Why shouldn't we worry about the Klima, huh? I was waiting for them to take him away, Monk. Quick, let me get you out of those ropes. You think you can take the Klima away? How come? He's one of them. The Klima is working with Santini? How long have you known that? Since Santini was tipped so mysteriously that the airmail package was coming to our office in New York, only the Klima had an opportunity to pass that information along. When the Klima came to me in Florida and offered his services as a bodyguard, Santini had sent him? Yes, Miss Avery. Uh, Doc, was I right about that silphium from C. Rene? You were, Johnny. I saw the weed, and it's definitely the highly medicinal species of silphium. Where do I get that extra Klima? I knew he was a phony all along. He was responsible for us getting caught. I found where Santini hid our weapons. Here are your super machine pistols. Some of the ammo drums were dud stock. I bet the Klima was responsible for that, too. Undoubtedly. But there's just one thing that ain't cleared up. What's turning men into skeletons on his island? That'll have to wait. You know what it is? Yes, but right now we've got to get out of here. And that means packing the cave where Santini and his men are. Let's hope they're quaffing their elixirs slowly. I don't think they are, Johnny. Here they come. They are loose. Shoot them in. Head for cover. <laughs> Continue to put them in the rest of all 
and fall. How about using those black balls on us? The cleaner says you can hold your breath till the gas loses its punch. Back it fast, Bring it in to me! God damn the cleaner! If I could have one week before I kick off, it would be get that bird in my hand. Everyone say I agree with you, Duck. I'm in favor of Russia. Let's go out with fireworks. Wait, Benny, there may be a better way. Wait, you think there's another way out? No, Monk, we won't even waste time hunting for one. Then what? Just wait. Let's see what happens. Say, Paul, I don't feel so good. Senores, do you feel strange? I, uh, I don't know. But, dear, we... Come on. Out there? Doc, we'll get killed. I don't think so. Holy cow. They're out cold. I've seen lots of unexpected things. But this comes near to magic than anything else. What happened to them? It's the silphium tea they drank. Huh? Is it poison? Not that I know of, Monk, but I put a powerful narcotic from your chemical knapsack into some of the silphium containers. You drugged them? Indirectly, yes. Now, let's get out of here. We've still got to find the parts they took off our plane. Even if we don't find them, we could repair the fuel tanks in Santini's plane and ship the gas from our ship. I suppose Dan Thunder punctured Santini's tanks. Son, I forgot all about the old coat. What became of him? There's your answer. That explosion shook the whole island. It came from one of the entrances. Thunder was tied up last I saw him. He must have gotten loose. He's tremendous at strong. A living example of how effective this fountain of youth is. Look, there! Thunder! I've got Santini's brigade. I'll close one entrance, and I'll get the other one after I let my little friends loose. When I open up the place again, there won't be nothing left of you but bones. <laughs> That's it. Where's he heading for, Doc? There's a heavy wooden door that shuts off part of the tavern. Seems to be making for that. What's behind the door? The things that made that skeleton we found on the beach and turned colored into one like... That old man's nature. If we don't head him off, he'll assume us here and try to look whatever's behind that door. There's the door ahead. Thunder's just opening it up. Blazes. He's on still. Yes, that would make sense. Look, he can't keep his balance running so fast. He's, he's falling off the still. Holy cow. Look at that floor. It's coming to life. Rising up and falling over Thunder's body like a brown blanket. He can't get away from it. My God, it's eating away his flesh. <laughs> Can't we do something? It's too late to help him. We've got to save ourselves. Run. Which way? The entrance on the stone slab should still be open. Head for that. There it is. Everybody, up the ladder. Stop. What are you doing? I retrieved one of Santini's grenades. I'm going to steal off the entrance. What about you? I'll get out of time. Hurry! Tanks are repaired and the fuel's been transferred. We can leave any time we like. Aren't we going to try to dig Santini and his gang out? I suspect there's little left of them but bones, Pat. What was that thing that flowed over Dan Thunder? Carnivorous pharmacodia. Use little words for once, will you, Johnny? Ants. Flesh-eating ants. Millions of them. Right, Doc? Yes. They're not unknown to science. They evidently used one part of the cavern for their colony. That's why Thunder shut it off at that door. Well, with them down there, we'll never get at them sophium weeds. That's not necessary, Monk. We still know where they grow here on the island. Yes, but they're no fountain of youth, as Santini believes. Huh? Silphium is a valuable medicinal herb. It's an amazingly effective antiseptic and tonic and may even prevent disease. But it does not prolong life. But Dan Thunder was uh, 131 years old. I suspect his longevity was due to basically perfect health and the fact that as an exile on this island, he was kept away from the distractions and dissipations of what we call civilization. So, Santini and his men were chasing a dream. Yes, Pat. 
a dream that has inspired men for centuries. But when we ultimately do find the secret to extending life, it will undoubtedly be the result of scientific knowledge and not the fountain of youth. And so, Doc Savage solves the riddle of the mysterious fear key and brings back to medical science the fabulous silphium weeds. But even as Doc and his party wing their way back to civilization, half a world away, sinister forces are at work, and Doc Savage will soon find himself caught up in one of the most dangerous adventures of his career. Don't miss The Black Stick, the first chapter of The Thousand-Headed Man, Next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Art Dutch, Bill Ratner, Kimmett Muston, Scott McKenna, Robin Riker, Marcia Kramer, Michael McConaughey, William Irwin, Douglas Kohler, and Bob Farley. Also heard was Bob Long. Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. Adventures of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Richter and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Tony? Well, what are you doing up here? Hello! Mike! Mike Glacier, isn't it? Well, well, smile. Mike. well. <laughs> you, you, you working up here? Uh, I mean, what, what are you yeah, doing? Well. How's Not all everything? the time, just a day. Oh, it must be Firm, be here. Ten years I'm at least. I'm with Benson Scissors, based in with, London. With who? I'm not in the theatre anymore. Aren't you? Uh, I'm touring with Clive Hitchcock, uh, new Jack Ritchie comedy, you, you know, at the Playhouse. <laughs> and listen, you're free for half an hour. Let's have a drink, eh? Um... Uh, yeah, well, okay, I, I've got to be down at Tower Square by ten. Oh, that's um, great. It's only uh, oh, just gone nine. Come on. It, they're open all day, market days. It, what made you chuck the theatre, then? Well, the theatre chucked me, actually. <laughs> well, not really. You know, you're right. It's time. The silent herald of life and death. Success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour.
Cheers. Oh, so and so. Cheers, Mike. Nice to see you again. Well, what have you been doing with yourself? You rich? You look it. <laughs> rich, my foot. Tell me, uh, what, what made you give up acting then? You were the bloke I thought was really going places. I did. Labour Exchange, Clifftops Hotel, Porter, Deck Chair <laughs> Attendant Ride, Isla sure. White, Car Factory at Gosport. I went everywhere. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. I know. We've all done all of that. Horrible, was it? <laughs> uh, but I really thought you'd be starring, no? Starring or starving? <laughs> no, it... Um... Well, you know, I did a bit of TV, had a six months run in Witch's Hollow at the Lyceum. A load of baloney that was, too. Then I had a long stint out, and I found I was getting more dough when I was out of the theatre than in it. Even the West End, and I thought, well, you know, hey, you've done all right. We watched you in the October game on ITV. Thought you were ruddy marvellous. <laughs> Tough. Last I heard of you, weren't you going up for that, uh, that David Keller play at the Aldwych? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was. Yes. That was in 57, wasn't it? Some, somewhere about there. Mm. I, I remember my agent telling me more or less who was going to do it. I was going to go along to the auditions for the Frenchman. I didn't get it. I gave it to a Frenchman, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how's your drink? Okay. Yeah, my agent reckoned they're as good as cast you. Audition was just a formality. It, didn't, didn't you fancy it or something? Good part. Huh? Second lead, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was, yes. He took it to the States afterwards, two years on Broadway. <laughs> I was sick inside out when they told me I wasn't in it. Of course, they'd probably recast my part over there. You'd have been all right, then. Oh. Ian Burridge played it in the end, and he's never looked back. Never come back, come to that. He's in every second Yankee picture you see. The eternal English butler. And he was with Marlon Brando in that thing by Edward Lucas as well. Rich as all get out now, yes. It, why yes, well, I, I, I got mucked up there. Oh, how do you mean? <laughs> well, I've never regretted it, you know. We've got four kids now. Four? Hmm. Oh, I'm still single. <laughs> and happy. Three yeah. girls and a boy. Yes, well, you always preferred girls, didn't you? <laughs> Have another. Uh, yeah, okay. No, the thing was, Arthur Wellman said they wanted me definitely for Water's Edge. Uh, Water's Edge, that was it, yeah. They, they filmed it, too, you know? Yeah, I know. With the Burry. Oh, all right, don't rub it in. <laughs> Sorry. Well, why didn't you play it then? You, I mean, if if they wanted to... Well, I didn't to, make the audition. Oh. They got all queer about it and took Burridge for the part. You, you mean you didn't go to the audition? A bit daft, wasn't it? Um, you, you've got a bit of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you haven't got to roar off anywhere for a bit. Well, I'm okay till just after... No, no, sure, sure. I, I'm just strolling around town. We, we've got a dress rehearsal this afternoon, that's all. Mm. It was all a bit crummy, really. I didn't... Hey, hang, hang on. Uh, a couple more, please. Ta. Yeah, huh? Well, I was a bit mixed up with this woman, as a matter of fact. Uh, Claire, her name was. She wasn't an actress, sort of model. Vera didn't know anything. I was pretty far gone on her. Uh, you're, you're still married to Vera, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. So oh. marvellous now. She never knew at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you. Oh, cut my throat. Hope to die. Mm. How, did, how did this affect the audition for Water's Edge, then? Well, I'm telling you. Mm. We were going to go away together, Claire and me. There was, there was only one baby then, little Martin. I mean... Well, it would have been a lousy thing to do, but, as I said, I was pretty hopelessly in love with her. She was married as well, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was a Wednesday, about this time in the morning, as a matter of fact. The auditions were at the Crosby Hall in Applegate. It was a lovely day, so I, I decided to walk. I was just crossing that little road near the park... I had plenty of time. I'm always early for things like auditions. More I was. I was crossing the road when I... I just looked up. I don't know why. And there was this man on this ledge of this tall building. About eight stories up. More, ten. I don't know. Anyway, he was balancing near the edge. There was an entrance to this block of flats... I thought I had to do something, so I belted in and up the stairs, and then I realized I didn't know which floor or whereabouts along the ledge he was. So I raced back and, and, and counted. He was still there. Oh, I was going to phone the police or something, but I, I didn't because I thought he'd probably jump while I was doing that. 
I tried to gauge more or less how many windows along from the corner and exactly how many flights up and all that. And up I went. Didn't wait for the lift. Just kept seeing this bloke falling. What had happened to him when he hit the ground? It occurred to me that he might be a workman and I might be making a Charlie of myself. But somehow I, I knew as well that this wasn't the case. There's something that nasty was going to happen. The first couple of places I looked out, I, I couldn't see him. I counted wrong, I suppose. I was about two landings from the very top. And then I saw him. He was about 30 feet along from the window where I looked out. I nearly called out. Then I realized I mustn't do that. I had to get closer. I squinted along and tried to gauge how many windows along he was. I counted the doors along the corridor. I was in this ordinary little flat. I opened the window and looked out. He was about 10 feet from me along on the ledge. He wasn't moving. I looked down and I, oh, I felt a bit sick. I didn't know what to do. Then he looked sideways and saw me. He didn't say anything. He just sort of leaned forward as if he was going to jump. Uh, please, uh, look, you, you, you'd better be careful. You, you, you might, uh, it's a long way down. I mean, what do you say in a case like that? Whatever you say is going to sound stupid and inadequate. I wasn't sure whether he'd heard me or not. Then I saw a closer window along the wall. I opened this. His boots were only about five feet along from me. He sort of moved quickly sideways, away, as if he was scared I was going to try and touch him. It's okay. Uh, uh, don't worry. I... Uh... Saw you from down there. It looks a, looks a bit dangerous. What, um, what are you doing? Huh? He didn't look at me. Just told me where to go and what to do, and he wasn't very polite. All this time, no one else had noticed. I remember thinking this was a bit queer, but there wasn't a soul about down in the street. An odd car went by. No one looked up or anything. I didn't know what to do. There was a phone in the flat, but who do you phone in that sort of situation? I had this feeling that if people came, he... Well, he must have reckoned I was trying to decide what to do because he spoke again without looking at me. Get out of my flat. You're trespassing. Oh, uh, it, it, it's, it's yours, is it? Why, why, don't you, why don't you come in? You, you might uh, fall or fall or something. Mind your own business. Care off. Uh, why, why are you, uh, uh, I mean, what, what, what's up? Um, look, you're, you're, you're right. It, it's none of my business, but I, look, you might regret it on the, on the, on the way down or something. Be, be a bit late then. Don't move your feet like that. You're, uh, feel like talking about it. Horrible thing to say. Feel like talking about it. Corny. Sort of thing a vicar might say in one of those television dramas. Thing is, this is how you tend to react to situations which are a bit melodramatic. You say corny things that have been said before. I couldn't think of any startling original dialogue. I mean, the whole situation was so crummy. Then I saw the time. I'd have to be smart if I was going to get over to Crosby Hall for my audition. Listen, I, uh, I've got to go now. And please don't jump or anything, Garth. W won't you come in? Y you could give me your hand. I I'll help you. Hey? Well, look, I, I've got to go. I looked over my shoulder, around the flat. There were a few women's things about, flowers and that. I knew he was married. Where's, um, 
Where's your uh, wife? Keep her away from me. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, okay, of course. Uh, Leave me alone! Look out, you'll fall! <laughs> Got a little boy, uh, Martin. You? Uh, is, is that why you've uh, why why you're doing this? Uh, because of, of, of something something wrong in, in in your marriage? No, this is a protest against the rising cost of living and starvation in China. Hey, what do you think? So, something wrong in your marriage? Get out of my flat. Yes. Well. Uh, you see, I've got to go anyway. Um, uh, look, I'll, I'll come back. I won't uh, be here then. Look, let, let me help you. Let me tell someone or something. Don't do this to me. It's not fair. What the blazes has it got to do with you? Well, uh, I saw you uh, uh, from down there. I mean, I, I couldn't just... Well, well, I had to. Public spirited, aren't you? No, not particularly, no. But... Uh, Look, I, I don't know you. You don't know me. After today, we'll probably never see one another again. And, That's and the truest thing you've said yet. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, but uh, what I mean, if you, if, you, if you can just talk a bit, well, well with a stranger, it, it might help. And then, well, if you still uh, feel the same way, what? Well, well, I mean, I suppose you better jump, hadn't you? I looked at the time, and even if I had wings, I couldn't have got to Crosby Hall then. If I left right away, I'd be late, but I could get over that. Suddenly, I felt an awful lot of antagonism. I began to curse this bloke in my mind for choosing just the minute I was passing to stand up there on that ledge like a stupid idiot. Only that's the way people want to go. They should do it quietly without any fuss, not make themselves the responsibility of a complete stranger. Look, uh, why don't, why don't you come in? I, uh, <coughs> I've got this important appointment. Well, go then! I'm not asking you to stay! I can't! Why not? Look, look stop jumping about. Uh, I mean, w women drive you around the bend, but if you stop to think about it, none of them are worth getting this cut up about. I mean, are they? You'll probably feel completely different tomorrow. I won't feel anything tomorrow. All right, but, uh, look, just, just give it a go. Tell me. Huh? Usual thing. Usual dreary business. Nothing new. Another man. Oh. Five years. I thought you'd been happy. I found out. He wasn't the first one. Began almost right away. There have been about six of them. I must have been blind. Yes. Well, uh, that, that's tough. But, but they're, they're not all like that. I mean, well, it, divorce. Uh, start all over again. She's, she's not worth bashing your brains out for, is she? How do you know? You never met Claire. Well, no, but... <laughs> Who? My wife. You've never met her. She's beautiful. A little dirty little... <laughs> you see, reason told me the whole world was full of clears. It was just a coincidence. I told myself this, but I knew in my heart, and suddenly I knew too, that I was never going to play Paul Friday in Water's Edge. I was never going to get to that audition. I began to hate myself for looking up and seeing that geezer on the ledge. I knew, too, that I was going to be lumbered with him till either he jumped or I could persuade him to come in. I knew, too, that if he did jump, I was as good as a murderer. The world is full of clears, but the one he was talking about was the one I was thinking of, and even then I remember feeling angry about what he'd said about there being six of them. 
I was just another one on the end of the queue. Suddenly I felt ever so sorry for this bloke. Got a cigarette? Uh, no, I, 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 I don't uh, smoke. There's some inside there, on the dresser. Could you? Uh, yes, uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, you, you won't do anything while, while, while I... No, I, mean, I won't. Not for a minute. Not for a minute? Uh, all right. I fiddled about inside and found the fags. I saw the photograph on the piano, too. Even now, after all these years, I sometimes find myself dreaming of that gorgeous little thing. About five feet one she was, with a figure like one of those girls you see in film magazines or on the front of record covers. Unbelievable. Claire, what a rotten, lousy coincidence. I saw a coat of hers I recognized slung over the back of a chair. Suddenly, I felt terribly sick. If she'd come in, I think I'd have throttled her and then gone and pushed her husband off this ruddy ledge just to be done with the whole thing. She didn't come in, though. I lighted a cigarette and passed it out to him. Don't try anything. Don't try grabbing me, chum. If you do, I'll pull you with me. Oh, I wouldn't like that. <coughs> Here. Thanks. So, your wife's played fast and loose, so you're thinking of doing away with yourself. I don't think that's a good enough reason. Did I ask what you thought? No. Well, shut up, then. Thought you had an appointment. I've, uh, I've missed it. My sincere apologies. The last one was an actor. Eh? Last? Oh, oh, Claire. An actor? That's an insult for a start. Oh, I, uh, I don't know. Some actors... Do pretty well, uh, TV, films, that, you know. What do you do? Me? Um, I, 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 I'm in insurance. You, you'd be more comfortable sitting in here smoking that fag. Uh, why, why don't you? He didn't say anything for a bit then. I felt pretty stupid. I didn't know what to do. Then I saw he was crying and I started to be frightened. For a bit when he was getting sarcastic and that, I thought he might chuck the whole thing and come in. But he was obviously getting all bitter again. And I should imagine that's when you do something without thinking. Then I looked down and saw the little crowd of people below. And I knew that there wasn't a lot of time left. Little black figures were running about down there and waving their arms and that. There were a couple of cars there too. I thought he'd be all right for a second or two, so I ducked in and locked the door just to be on the safe side. I went back to the window and looked out again. <laughs> Well, the... No! Why? You... Oh! <laughs> he crossed over in front of the window to the left-hand side of it. I thought he jumped. Oh, you're the comedian, aren't you? Funny. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, why the ruddy heck don't you jump then? Go on, don't promise us all. Jump! He looked as if he hated me for a minute then. Suddenly he went all sort of stiff and he... Looked as if he was crying again, and I realized he really did mean it. Not like a lot of people who do that sort of thing. Okay, I... Well, I'm sorry. Look, please, won't you come in? This is ruddy stupid, this whole business. Don't do this for a woman. The world's full of things to do. Well, don't kill yourself for a lousy woman. And believe me, I really said that word lousy as if I meant it. There were more people scurrying about down below. He saw them too. He looked sort of pleased in a sick kind of way. Somehow I knew it wouldn't be long then. So, how about it? What? Coming in. Goodbye. Listen! Don't be so stupid! He flicked away a cigarette then and pressed his hands against the wall behind him. I felt more frightened than I'd ever been before in the whole of my life. And suddenly too, I thought of something else. I was the other man in this affair, although he didn't know that. It was going to look a bit awkward, wasn't it? Me, the chap his wife was going about with, up here with him, and he jumps out and kills himself. I could see the whole court business. Ah, but did he jump? The man's knuckles went sort of white, and I, I knew he was pressing to get leverage, and I stretched quickly as far as I dared and got hold of him. <laughs> look, stop it! You'll have me out at all! Leave it! I'd had it then. 
I had to get the beggar in. I wasn't going to stand up at all, not in court afterwards. An unwanted husband decides to do away with himself, and the other man, the third member of the triangle, tries to stop him. Oh, do me a favor. His foot slipped, and for a moment I had the whole weight of him on one arm, and I thought I was going to lose him. But I got my other arm out, too, and got him under the chin. <laughs> Somebody was doing them right outside the door. It'd be only a minute or two, and they'd be in, I reckon. I wanted them in there, and suddenly I realized he was trying to tear himself away from me and go over the edge. He really was sincere, after all. I couldn't put him in on my own. There wasn't room enough for anybody else to get in there. I needed his help. He had to want to come in. It's a good idea, and it worked, too. Listen, you're Godfrey Jenkins, aren't you? And Claire's your wife. I know her. I'm the bloke she's been going round with. I'm the actor. Show me. You liar. 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 I'm Tony Watson. It's not every woman in London that's got a birthmark shaped like... Like on a... Fine. Boy, is she hot stuff. Hey, hold for it. Do it. No, no. Oh, shut up. Oh, oh. It worked anyway. He came up over that window ledge as if it was the only thing in the world he wanted to do was to kill me. He nearly made it, too. I remember there were about three policemen and half a dozen other odd bods in the room, and it took all of them to pull him off me. Now tell me you didn't make it all up. Eh? Oh, no, honest, straight up. True as I'm on this bus. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. You saved his life, then. I mean, I mean, what a, what a crazy coincidence. <laughs> so, what happened? Oh, we were carted off for questioning and everything. He was taken to hospital then and given a sedative or something, and, well, it didn't get into the papers, and... <laughs> That was a miracle I reckoned I deserved. Vera never found out. I um, met him afterwards, Godfrey thing. He, um, he was quite decent about it. Embarrassed, of course, but he thanked me because he really was going to take the high dive that morning. <sighs> Makes you all sort of religious, really, doesn't it? Because I was obviously meant to be passing at that time, and I was meant to look up. Did he uh, patch it up? We with uh, Claire? No, no, they got, um, they got divorced and he cleared off to Canada. Never heard of either of them since. So another beer. It's nearly twelve o'clock. Hey? Oh, blimey. Another appointment I've missed. <laughs> Never mind. Too late now. Same again? Yeah, okay. So, uh, you're okay with Vera? Everything's all right, hmm? oh, I've never been happier. Well, oh, I thought I'd chuck the theatre and become a new person altogether. No more dramas, faithful husband, little house, nice kids, no more. Claire's. Mm. Uh, two more pints, please. Uh, tell me, what, what was this, uh, this birthmark she had, uh, Claire had on her... Uh, it was, uh, shaped just like a question mark. Uh -huh. Just, um, here on her right thigh. She was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the whole of my life. Ironic, really. Question mark. Even now, sometimes, when I had a couple of beers, I wonder what would have happened if old Godfrey had jumped out and I hadn't seen him and I had got the part in Water's Edge and gone to the States and she'd come with me. You'd have probably jumped out of a window somewhere. And they are up in America. <laughs> Cheers.
Your Haunted Lives – True Tales of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey, a collection of creepy, often downright chilling true experiences of the paranormal submitted by visitors to the My Haunted Life 2 website. The tales have been carefully selected and edited and range from apparitions to hauntings to demons through to the downright bizarre. This terrific collection of true stories of the paranormal will keep you looking over your shoulder. Your Haunted Lives – True Tales of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Darren Marlar Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com an election bet yesterday? Feel a bad cold coming on? Want to get away from it all? We offer you escape. You were groping in the midnight dimness of a gigantic department store, and suddenly you realize that you're not alone but a hundred eyes are glaring at you from the shadows, a hundred hands reaching for your throat, and your most urgent desire is to escape. Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the dark labyrinth of a giant department store in the dead of night and to a fantastic world of night dwellers as John Collier imagines it in his eerie story Evening Primrose. A Sadie? Ah! Sadie, hey, what's the matter? It's me. Oh, Sam, you nearly scared me to death. What do you mean coming in so quiet? Hey, I didn't mean to scare you. I thought you'd be asleep. I didn't want to wake you. Oh, Sam, I'm glad you're home. Hey, hey what's the matter? Oh, it's terrible. You got to do something, Sam. Oh, well, 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 what's terrible? It's this. Just look at this. Oh, what's terrible about that? Looks like an ordinary pad of paper to me. Yeah, it just did. That's just what I thought. But it's got writing in it. It's awful. Now, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell me what this is all about. Well, today I went shopping down at Bracey's department store. I I needed some writing paper, so I picked this up. It it was on top of the pile and bought it and brought it home. But tonight when I opened it, I found it's got writing in it. Well, that's nothing so terrible. Just take it back tomorrow and make him give you a new one. Oh, no, you don't understand. It's what's written in it that's so terrible. What do you mean, what's written in it? Here, you gotta read it. Oh, Sadie. No, no, right now. Read it. Look, Sadie, I'm tired. I've been bowling all Please, Sam, the... please. Just read it. Uh, all right, for Pete's sake. Uh, October 13. Today I made my decision. I decided to say goodbye to the world to get out. Leave, break away. And I have done it. Ah, oh, Sadie, it's a lot of... Go on, read. Uh, and now I am free. Really, really free. free. Yes, yes, I, I am, am free. free at last. The world is an intolerable place for a poet. I was broke, starving at my wit's end. And then I had a brilliant idea. I would escape to a place where I had no need to earn a living, where I could write to my heart's content in peace and security. Where is this place? Right under your nose. So close you'd never think of it. I am now living in Bracey's department store. I have everything within arm's reach that anyone would need or desire. And it's all free. Absolutely free. 
I arrived this afternoon. I'd spent three days looking over all of the department stores in town. I decided on Bracey's because of the completeness of their food department. Therefore, this afternoon, I entered the store and went immediately to the fourth floor to the rug department and hid myself in this dusty, out-of-the-way corner behind a pile of carpets. Once I'm settled, I'll furnish it with the best of modern pieces from the furniture department. It's small, but I'll be cozy enough. And safe. After the store closed, I made my first venture out. I tiptoed as far as the stationery counter and got this paper, the writer's primary need. Now, after making my initial entry, I'll go out and get food, wine, the pillows for my bed, perhaps a fancy dressing gown. This is perfect. I'll be able to write here. Dawn, October 14th. I'm almost too unnerved to write this. The whole thing is unbelievable. After the store was dark and completely quiet, I crept out and started for the food department. One's footsteps echo hollowly in an empty department store at night, and I found myself gliding along the floor on tiptoe, moving as silently as possible. But the sound of footsteps persisted. Suddenly I realized they were not my own. The night watchman. I was in the Salon Moderne. Quickly I seized a mink coat from a hanger, draped it about my shoulders, and stood stock still. I could have reached out and touched him, but he passed by without so much as a glance. I started to smile, but the smile froze on my lips. There was someone else here. I was looking straight into a pair of eyes. Large, flat, luminous, inhuman eyes peering at me from among the Mrs. Tailored suits a dozen feet away. They belonged to a creature dressed as a man, but he was as pale as a creature found under a stone. His hands hanging motionless at his sides looked more like the fins on a fish than human hands. And then he spoke. Not bad for a beginner. I... I'm sorry, I didn't know anybody else uh, lived here. Oh, yes. We live here. It's delightful. We? Yes, all of us. Don't you see? Look around you. I looked around. I saw nothing. I looked again. I saw an old man come clambering out from behind a clock. There were three elderly ingenues, incredibly emaciated, pale as lace, almost transparent, simpering before the perfume counter. A chintzy lady swam out from the curtains and drapes. They came swarming thick around me, pale, thin, wispy, moving silently, fluttering like gauze in the wind, whispering. How raw he looks. Who is he? As coarse as the sun. What is he doing here? A detective. Send for the dark men. Yes, send for the dark men. The dark men. They were pressing around me, clawing, holding me, their pale faces contorted with venomous, inhuman hatred. I was paralyzed. All I could do was repeat over and over again, I'm not a detective, I'm not a detective, I'm not! A burglar, then! A burglar? Tie him up! Hold him, carry him to the place! Send for the dark men! Stop! Stop! Let him speak! I'm not a detective. Or a burglar. I'm a poet. Then what are you doing here? I've... I've renounced the world. I came here to live where I could be alone. Away from the world. Why, then, he's come over to us. He's just like us. He's come over to us, a poet. He must meet Mrs. Vanderpant. Yes, Mrs. Vanderpant. She's coming now. I followed their eyes toward the balcony. There, coming down the wall like an ancient spider, clambered an old lady, wrinkled and cracked and emaciated. She must have been at least 80, a shadowy matriarch. And the things around me bowed and scraped as she reached the floor and floated toward us. What's 
going on here? Where is that stupid girl? What's keeping her? Oh, uh, Mrs. Vanderpant. Well, what is it? Who's this, Mr. Roscoe? Uh, Mrs. Vanderpant. May I present Mr... Uh... Well, uh, Snell, Mr. Snell, Mr. Charles Snell. Yes, yes, of course. Mr. Snell. He is a poet, and he's come here to live. Oh, he has, has he? That's what he says, and I believe him. Well... Uh, he avoided the night watchman quite neatly, uh, for a beginner. Well, thank you. Hmm. Very well, we shall see. A poet should find inspiration here. Mr. Snell... Mrs. Vanderpant is our grand old lady. Oh? I am quite the oldest inhabitant here, Mr. Snell. Three mergers and a complete rebuilding. But they didn't get rid of me. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Where is Ella? Where is my broth? She's bringing it, Mrs. Vanderpant. Oh, terrible little creature. Uh, she is our foundling, Mr. Snell. Uh, she's not quite our sort. Is that so? I have been here, Mr. Snell, ever since the terrible times of the 80s. I was a young girl then, a beauty, they say, and poor papa lost his money. Oh, braces meant a lot to a young girl in those days. So when I wasn't able to have a charge account, I came here for good. That's better than a charge account. I was quite alarmed when others began to come after the crash of 1907. But it was the dear judge. How do you do? Yes. The colonel. How do you do? Yes. Mrs. Bilby. How do you do? Mrs. Bilby. Uh, Mrs. Bilby writes plays. Oh. And comes of an old Philadelphia family. Oh, you will find us quite nice here, Mr. Snell. I'm sure I will. Uh, and, of course, all our dear young people came in 1929. Their poor papas jumped from skyscrapers. They couldn't bear to be without charge accounts, either. Do you mean all these people live here? Oh, and many more. You shall meet them all later. Oh, here comes Ella with my block. Come, come, you stupid thing. Mrs. Vanderpant is waiting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm coming as fast as I can. Now, be careful. Don't spill it. Oh, but she's young. Well, of course, she is a little younger than most of them. And she... she's different. She's beautiful. Mr. Snell, Ella is Mrs. Vanderpant's maid. That's right, old man. She's really not our sort at all. You shouldn't say such things. She can hear you. Oh, that doesn't matter. You'll understand these things better after you've been here a while. But it seems to me that you would... Mr. Snell... We have certain rules here. They are necessary for our survival. I'm sure you won't find it hard to observe them. Well, yes, I appreciate... I should advise that you try. If you do not, that would be most unfortunate, Mr. Snell. Most unfortunate for you. <laughs> October 15th. You can imagine my feelings last night. My first thought was to escape as quickly as possible. In fact, I planned to wait till morning when the store opened, then quit my hiding place, mingle with the crowds, and leave Bracey's forever. But just at dawn, Mr. Roscoe brought me a cup of coffee, which must have been drugged, for I fell asleep. And when I awoke, I found I had slept all day, and night was closing over the store once more. <laughs> Later, I've spent my second night here. I saw Ella again. Ella, the pearl of this remote, fantastic cave. She's not like the others. A trifle pale, but otherwise normal, and human, and beautiful. A child of perhaps 18. She's the only thing that makes this nightmare bearable. October 20th. Escape seems almost impossible. There's a very effective burglar alarm system and the doors are all carefully guarded. But that's nothing compared to the dark men. Who are the dark men? I don't know. But they threaten any transgressor with these dark men. I shall try to discover who they are. At least I'm sure I'm watched, though they've begun to trust me now. Speaking to the night watchman would be suicide. 
Even if he believed my fantastic story or didn't shoot me as a burglar, I'm convinced that neither Ella nor I could get out of here alive. She and the Night Watchman are the only real people here. And how the others hate the Night Watchman. Odious, vulgar creature. He reeks of the coarse sun. Oh, come now, Mrs. Bilby. He's really a personable young man. Very young for a Night Watchman. Mr. Snow, sometimes I wonder about your taste. You mustn't stay so much to yourself, Mr. Snell. You must become better acquainted with our ways. Yes, old man. You must come to the play tonight. We're going to be entertained with one of Mrs. Bilby's tragic comedies. Love in Shadowland. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. I'm sure I will. It's really a festive occasion, you know. Wanamaker's is coming over. Wanamaker's? Yes. The entire colony over at Wanamaker's is coming here en masse to attend the play. You mean there are people living in other stores? Oh, dear, yes. Didn't you know? Of course, the best people live in braces and Wanamaker's. Oh, come now, Mrs. Bilby. There's some very nice people at Alton's. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Bilby. Oh, hello, Ella. Good evening, Mr. Snell. Mrs. Bilby. Well, what is it? Please, ma'am, I'd so love to see your play tonight. May I have your permission? Certainly not. You know better than that, you stupid creature. You know where you belong? In the basement, by the garbage cans. But Mrs. Bilby Hush, couldn't... Mr. Snell. Ella, you're becoming entirely too forward of late. I'd advise you to watch your step. Remember the dark men. Oh, no, please, Mr. Roscoe. I'll be good, I promise I will. No, please don't send for the dark men. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bilby, excuse me. Ella, come back. Mr. Snell, you forget yourself. Let her go. But how can you treat her like that? Why do you always frighten her? And what is all this about the dark men? Well, the... Oh, now. please, Mr. Roscoe, not now. You'll spoil our whole evening. And I do so want Mr. Snell to enjoy my play. Very well. Later, Mr. Snell. But I want to know about the dark man. Later, later. October 21st. At last I found an opportunity to speak to Ella alone. I hadn't dared to speak to her before. Here one has a sense always of pale eyes secretly watching. But last night at the play, I induced a fit of hiccups. As I anticipated, I was sternly reprimanded and told to go and secrete myself in the basement where the night watchman wouldn't hear me. This was exactly what I had planned. I went to the basement. There in the darkness, among the garbage cans and the rats, I heard sobbing. Ella! Ella! Oh. Ella, is that you? Yes. Why are you crying? What is it, Ella? They... They wouldn't even let me see the play. Is that all? Oh, Mr. Snell. I'm so unhappy. There, there. You mustn't cry. You're the only one... The only one who's kind. Ella, why are you here? Why do they treat you so differently? Because I'm not like them. I didn't choose to come here. You mean you're held prisoner? Yes. You see, I was only six... I came here on a shopping tour with my mother. I got lost and fell asleep behind a counter. It was dark when I awoke and they found me. Some of them wanted to send for the dark men because they were afraid I would tell on them. But Mrs. Vanderpant said, no, I could stay and be her maid. I've been here ever since. Since you were six? Haven't you ever tried to get away? Oh, no. I don't know anything about... out there. I wouldn't know what to do. Besides... I'm afraid. If anyone tries to get out, they send for the dark men. Ella, who are the dark men? Don't you know? Oh, it's horrible. Tell me. You know how people live in all the stores, at Gimbel's and Bloomingdale's Yes, and... yes, I know. Well, the dark men live at the Undertaker's. Good heavens. And whenever someone dies, or breaks the rules, or when a burglar gets in and sees these people and might tell, they send for the dark men. Oh, horrible. They put the body in the butcher shop in the food department. And then the dark, dark men come. I saw them once. It was terrible. What do they do? They go in where the dead person is. They have wax with them and all sorts of things. And when they're gone, there's just a wax model left on the counter. Then our put, people put a frock on it, or a bathing suit, and mix it up with the other wax models in the windows. And nobody ever knows. Ella. You mean all these dummies around us? Oh, not all of them. But if you displease these people, the same thing will happen to you. (laughs) 
October 30th. I haven't kept up my journal. Writing has been out of the question. Once more, I'm frozen with terror. But not for myself now. For Ella. They hate her. Any time they might turn against her and send for the Dark Men. My mind is filled with her. I dream of her every day. I live to see her at night. We've managed it several times. They trust me now and let me roam about without interference. Finally tonight, I met her again and said it. Ella, I love you. Oh, Charles. I love you, Ella. Let's get married. Or whatever they do here. Then we can live together in my home in the carpet department. They wouldn't dare hurt you then. Oh, Charles, Don't look I... so dismayed. If you like, we'll go away from here. Maybe we can get transferred to... To Bergdorf Goodman's, overlooking Central Park. Don't, Charles, don't. You mustn't. But I love you. Ella, you're not in love with someone else. Yes, Charles, I am. But who? I thought you hated them all. It must be Roscoe. He's the only one that's young enough. Oh, no, Charles, not Roscoe. Especially not him. I do hate them all. They make me shudder. Well, who is it, then? It's him. Who? The night watchman. No, impossible. I love him. He smells of the sun. Ella. Oh, it was wonderful the way it happened. Don't tell on me, Charles, or they'll punish me. Oh, no, no. I was careless, and there he was, coming around the corner in the ladies' lingerie department. I was caught. There were only some wax models in their underthings. There was nothing else to do. I slipped off my dress and stood still. Oh, I see. He stopped and looked at me. And Charles, he spoke to me. He said, Say, honey, I wish they made him like you on 8th Avenue. Charles, wasn't that a lovely thing to say? Personally, I should have said Park Avenue. It doesn't matter what street. It was a lovely thing to say. But what can you do about him? Ella, he belongs to another world. Yes, to 8th Avenue. I want to go there. Charles, are you really my friend? Yes, of course I am. And I'll tell you... I'm going to stand there again in the lingerie department, so he'll see me. And then? Perhaps he'll speak to me again. Ella, you're only torturing yourself. No, because this time I shall answer him. He'll take me away. Take you away? Oh, no, Ella, I couldn't bear that. You don't love him. You only think you do because you think he'll take you out of here, but you don't know that he will. And I will, Ella. I've made up my mind. No, Charles, I couldn't let you do it. Even if I loved you, you couldn't do it, Charles. Why not? Because... You really belong here. You're... You've become one of them now. Ella, you mustn't say that. It's true. And... Charles, I've got to go. There's someone watching us. I feel it. No, wait, Ella. Goodbye, Charles. No, Ella. Come back. Ella. Please, old man. You'll arouse the night watchman. Roscoe. Yes. Oh, love can be very upsetting, can't it? You heard? Yes. Just the last moment or so. Very touching. (laughs) Yet, it's understandable. I've been attracted to Ella myself. So she loves another, hmm? Too bad, old boy. Who could it be? Could it be that I am the cause of your heartbreak? You flatter yourself too much, Roscoe. Well, then whom? The old judge? Oh, certainly not. The colonel? Hardly. None of those. Oh, not one of the customers. The staff? She loves the night watchman. Can you imagine that? She loves the... Roscoe, I shouldn't have said that. It's not true. At least I don't think it's true. You wouldn't... Roscoe, you said you loved her too. You wouldn't do anything. Tell anybody. This is a secret between us. Between friends, isn't it? Of course, old man. As secret as the grave. She's young. Perhaps he'll leave and she'll forget him in time. Who knows? Perhaps she'll learn to love you or me. Of course, in time. And we'll figure a way to keep her safe here. Absolutely safe. Now, don't you worry about it. It's almost dawn. Time for bed. Good morning, Mr. Snell. Early evening, November 4th. I was a fool. I should have known he couldn't be trusted. He must have gone straight to Mrs. Vanderpant because this evening the atmosphere has changed. People flicker to and fro, smiling nervously, horribly with a sort of frightened, sadistic exaltation. 
an informal dance in the record department has been called off. I can't find Ella. I'm going out again now to look for her. Roscoe, what have you done with her? Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, old boy. The night watchman. I don't care. What have you done? Whatever I did was for your own good as well as for the good of us all. Wait a minute. What is that? What are those people carrying? That's Ella. She's tied up. They're carrying... Ella! Ella! Stop Stop it, Charles. Stop it. Oh, let me go. Oh, stop, Charles. Stop it. You'll arouse the night watchman. No, they're... They're taking her in... Into the butcher shop. Roscoe. Yes. Those are the dark men. Good Lord. Midnight. I'm scribbling this last entry hurriedly. They are in there in the butcher shop with Ella. The dark men. There's only one thing to do. I'm going to find the night watchman and tell him. He and I will save her if we can. And if we are overpowered... Well, I will leave this pad on the stationery counter. Tomorrow, if I live, I will recover it. If I do not, whoever finds this and reads it, look in the store windows. Look for three new wax dummies. Two men, one rather sensitive looking, and a girl. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. And her nose turns up a little. Look for us. And then find them. Smoke them out. Exterminate Exterminate them. them. Avenge us. Oh, Sam, isn't it horrible? Ah. We we, got to do something. Tell somebody something. Oh, Sam, what'll we do? Do? Nothing. Go to bed. But Sam! Well, whoever wrote this has sure got a weird sense of humor. It's probably some clerk down at Bracey's who ought to be fired. But you... You mean you, you think it's just a story? Are you kidding? You don't believe this stuff, do you? Well, well I don't know. I, I, I Oh, just... forget it, baby. Come on, snap out of it. I shouldn't leave you alone. You get too many ideas when I go out bowling at night. But, uh... Don't you think maybe we ought to just, uh... Take it back and show somebody? Oh, nuts. It's not worth a bother. They'd laugh at you, baby. You think you were crazy or something. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you're right. I guess I was silly. Forget it. Oh, come on. Let's go to bed. I'm tired. Okay. Okay, Sam. Gee, you know, there for a while I sure was scared. (laughs) I even forgot what I was going to tell you. Sam, I found the cutest dress today, only $19.95. Yeah, baby? Yeah. It was in the window at Bracey's. It was on a beautiful little wax model with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a turned-up nose. And there were two men standing beside... Sam! Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight brought you Evening Primrose by John Collier. Adapted for radio by John Dunkel. With Elliot Lewis as Charles Snell, Paul Fries as Roscoe, and Pat Lowry as Ella. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Pure. Next week... After you've had a tough day at the office or leaning over a hot stove, when your four walls seem to be closing in on you, next week at the same time when you want to get away from it all, we again offer you escape. This 
is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Exploring Tomorrow! And now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr. There's the old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, it isn't really power that corrupts, but immunity, immunity to punishment and control. And every fool with a little power wants to achieve that immunity. Usually it's held that like attracts like. The two individuals with the same great fundamental characteristic will be normally attracted to each other. You know, this isn't necessarily so. It may not be true. You may have two people who don't like each other, but are forced by the very nature of the fact that they have a unique characteristic to endure each other. Oh, just a little more. <laughs> oh, Alan, isn't it beautiful the way it bubbles and bubbles? <laughs> oh, Alan, let's have champagne every night on our honeymoon. You want to take a bath in it? I can arrange that, too. Oh, Alan, <laughs> really? <laughs> pink champagne? <laughs> just as pink as you're blushing right now. Oh, Alan. What's the matter? Do you think Mr. and Mrs. Alan Carvel are going to live like the rest of the slobs? I tell you, baby... Alan. What's wrong, Alan? Nothing. Alan. You look so funny all of a sudden. Get off my back. Thank heaven I've found you. Why haven't you been answering me these last few days? Do I have to check in with you everything I do, every place I go? Alan? No, it's all right. I'm, I'm all right, Jean. J -j Just leave me alone for a minute, hmm? Get out of my mind, Laurie. Get out, I tell you. I'll talk to you later. You'll talk to me now. What are you doing with this child? What are you trying to hide from me? All right, all right. I'll get rid of her and then I can talk to you. Give me 20 or 30 minutes to take her home. I'll give you half an hour, that's all. And don't try to close up your mind and hide from me again. All right, all right, I say. Jeannie. Jeannie, it's all right. Oh, you went so white there all of a sudden. Alan, honey, are you sick? No, no, it's just one of those migraine headaches of mine. Honey, I, look, I'd better take you home. Oh, honey. No, it's all right. I, I just need some sleep, that's all. Come on, let's get your coat. Oh, you, you better not come in. That old landlady. Oh, that's okay. Good night, baby. Oh. Good night now. And, and get lots of sleep. Take care of your poor head. Call me in the morning. That's a deal. Good night, honey. Good night, Alan. What makes you do things like that, Alan? You stuck with me every inch of the way, didn't you? How old is she? Sixteen? Seventeen. 
puts it to you. Oh, I have to be conscience for both of us. Thank you, sweet Lorraine. Who asked you to? You did, Alan. You always have. All these things you do are challenges to me to set right. All your venom against a fate that made you one of the only two telepaths in the world is twisted against me, your only partner in this lonely land. You strike out at me because I'm like you, and because by the same chance that made us, I'm the stronger one. That's a lie. I can break loose from you any time. I... Let me go. I... I can't breathe. I won't hurt you, Alan. I could never hurt you. Though I thank whoever or whatever's responsible for making us as we are, that it's me, not you, who has the additional power to reach out and move physical objects with my mind. You would. You waste something like that and then feel good about it. What I could do with something like that. Why don't you leave me alone? Because I love you, Alan. If you'd been a man with decent instincts, bound as we are together, we could have married and found what little happiness is possible for two like us in this world. But there's a twisted streak in you that wouldn't let you settle for that. Go ahead, play the little mother. You're no good for anything else. You didn't think so once, Alan. You're over the hill, baby. Face it. I've faced it, Alan. Have you? What do you mean? Can't you see you're getting worse? When we were just children together, before we'd even seen each other face to face, we used to talk to each other at night, clear across the city, mind to mind, about how someday we'd go out and find others like us. But if you had the chance to find someone like us now, you wouldn't take it. You don't want others. You want to be the only one. Why not? Why not? You've got a gun in your pocket right now. Don't you see the danger in all that? Don't you know what it can do to you? Don't try to scare me, or I'm not trying to scare you, Alan. A telepath living in a world of non-telepaths is not a normal person. He can't be. He has to walk a chalk line all the time to preserve his sanity. He can't afford inner conflicts or emotional violences or shocks. What do you plan to do with that girl? What's the gun for? And what's that you're trying to hide right now, right under the surface of your mind there? All right. You want to know? I'll tell you. I'm getting out. I'm getting away from this city and away from you and that girl goes with me. I'm going to take what I want, anything I want, and live like I deserve to, and you can't stop me. Alan! Alan, answer me! Don't suck yourself off from me like that! Alan! Alan! Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. This is Bill Goodwin. You know, someone once said humor is the true democracy. And that's why we Americans can smile when we tell the stories of the legendary heroes who helped to build our country's great institutions and industries. Like Boleg Bill, hero of the tuna fishing industry. Back in Provincetown, Massachusetts, they claimed that when it came to hauling in the horse mackerel, as the Easterners call tuna, Bill could handle two gaffs at once and catch more than any six men put together. And they're still talking about the time Bill caught old Slick Britches, the biggest horse mackerel of them all. No one could ever get his hooks into slick britches who weighed 2,000 pounds and had a tail six feet long. But Bowleg Bill promised to land him single-handed. He set out in his boat, toss up, and when he spotted slick britches, he made a grab for him. But the tuna slipped through his hands. So Bill dove over the side, and before folks knew what had happened, Bill was sitting astride old slick britches who was bucking like a bronco. He leaped almost a mile out of the water, but Bill hung on. All over the harbor they went, jumping and leaping, but still Bill hung on. Finally, Slick Riches gave one last leap over the toss-up and then calmed down all the fight gone out of him. Bill steered him toward shore, but all of a sudden, he headed him back out to sea, slapped the tuna's tail and jumped off. The folks were mighty disappointed when Slick Riches disappeared, but it's like Bill told them, there's nothing that'll break a cowhand's heart so quick as to find a critter with the rough all rode off at the first mount. Yes, sir, it is a democracy which lets us tell the stories of such a legendary character as Bowleg Bill with a twinkle in our eyes and a chuckle in our throats. And so long as we continue to laugh together as a people, ladies and gentlemen, we will live together as a nation. Telepathy has long seemed like a wonderful thing to have, a wonderful possession. But have you ever considered it in terms of the absolute end of privacy? You know, explorers have found that if you put two men in one little cabin isolated far away from the rest of the world, they don't learn to like each other. They learn to hate each other. 
Now, Sue, the wicked honey? Uh, oh, I, I thought she was going to watch the Late Late Show on Channel 2. Well, it's just a little past midnight. Oh, I'm sorry I woke you, honey. It just felt like phoning. Hmm? No, it's quiet as a church. Been through the plant in the tool shop four times already. I just going to check the offices and... Oh, now, come on. Now, stop worrying. Nobody knows about these night payroll deliveries. Anyway, they've come and gone. The money's already in the safe. Sure. Sure, I will. What? That's a gun you feel in your back. You say goodbye and hang up fast. And don't sit around. Uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it's all right. I, I, I just remembered I forgot to ring in. And I'll better hurry and do that right now. I'll call you back later. Uh, goodbye. All right, let's head for that safe over there. Now move. Don't worry. I have a healthy respect for guns. It is, that is over there. Uh, I don't know what good's going to do. I, I ain't got the combination. Shut up. I'll stand over there where I can watch you. Hey. You opened it right up. Who told you the combination? The president of the company. Are you kidding? What is this, a gag of some kind? Look, if this is just a joke, mister. No. I didn't make... Think about jumping me, will you? Yes. Rob? Rob? Slob, that's all he was, a slob. Oh, Alan, please tell me what this is all about. You go home with a migraine headache and, and you call up and get me out in the middle of the night and you keep drinking, but you won't tell me what's the matter. What's the matter? <laughs> that's a funny one. Come here. Come here, come close. I'm going to tell you something. Alan, you're hurting my arm. Listen to me. You want to know some? You know how trees think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They think really long, slow, and peaceful, and sometimes they take all winter just to think one, one little thought. Mm -hmm. Thinking? Oh, it isn't real thinking. It's just living, uh, you know? You hear them living calm and quiet and slow. And, and cats. Listen to me, baby. You know how cats think? I, 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 no. Well, cats think sort of S-shaped, like a snake crawling. And dogs, you know, dogs are all excited. Up and down, you know, like a pogo stick. <laughs> Even when they're dreaming. Everything thinks. Do you know that, Jimmy? Everything. All day long. Forever. Never. Everything goes on thinking. As long as it lives, you win the dime. Alan, are you cold? Let mm. me hold you. Oh, you're shivering like crazy. Give me a drink. Mm. Sweetheart, you've had enough. I want a drink, I said. Here, give me yours. You're not touching it anyway. Alan, I really think you shouldn't. Ah, look, I got a better idea. Tell you what, let's, let's get out of here. Let's get out of this town tonight and we'll go far away where she can never find us. We'll take my car and we'll head south. Right now. We can buy what we need as we go. We get married on the way. What do you say, Jeannie? Well, Alan, I You love me. I... Don't you love me, baby? You, you said you'd always do anything I ever wanted. Well, this is what I want. Get out tonight. And don't worry about money. I got lots of it. Yeah? Sure. Where did you get a lot of money all of a sudden? I'll tell you when we're on the road, okay? Well, answer me. Or I'll leave you behind here. Alan, you, you wouldn't go off and leave me. Well, of course not, honey. But I gotta go. There's, there's no two choices about it. I gotta go now. Now you're coming with me, aren't you? One of the worst things about a conscience is that the darn thing is always going with you wherever you are. Alan had something other than a conscience. And running away didn't do much good. You know, telepathy has no distance limitations. Alan. Alan. What? It's starting to get light. Alan, you never did tell me where you got the money. Not now. Not now. Can't you see I'm out of my feet? Well, we could stop and get a couple of hotel rooms somewhere. No, we've got to keep driving. But we're nearly a hundred miles out of town already. You, you keep saying we've got to keep driving, but... I don't see why we couldn't stop for just a few hours. Oh, shut up, will you? Alan. You don't like it? Get out and take a bus back. Who needs you? Oh. I don't know what's wrong with you. You never used to be like this. Then last night... Well, just shut up! Alan. Uh, what? Nothing, nothing. 
Alan. I'm not turning back. Yes, you are, Alan. This time you're turning back even if I have to make you... Make me, then. Alan, you're slowing down. She's making me. She's making me... Talk out loud. You look in pretty bad shape. Give me a cigarette. There's some on the desk. I'm glad you came right back here when I turned you around. Chose there's some hope. I'll cut it out. What did you stop me for? That watchman. It was you, Alan, wasn't it? What watchman? Alan. All right, all right. Yes, it was me. He was a slob, so he's dead. So what? The gun you beat him to death with is in your pocket right this minute. So what? So I'm going to have to make you go to the police and show them the gun and tell them. You can't do that by remote control. You have to go with me. I'll go with you. And what will you tell them about how you happen to know all this? How about that? I will tell them. What about us? About me and you? About you? I don't want to. Are you crazy? You know what that would mean? You think they'd believe you? And if they did, what it'd be for the rest of your life? You'd be owned, Laurie. Owned. Guarded and locked away by them. The slobs, like a piece of machinery, made to do what they wanted you to do for them. You'd never be free again. All I ever wanted was what any woman wants. The chance to lead a normal life. Look at me, Alan. I'm not bad looking. I never was. But the only man I could ever have been a normal wife to was you. And you never grew up. You've been a selfish little boy all your life, and I, I've paid for it. Why didn't you leave me alone? Just leave me alone. Leave you alone? Do you think you ever really wanted me to leave you alone? I was forced to love you the same way the only woman in the world would be forced to love the only man in the world. Well, now it's too late. I can't let you kill again. Then do it. Go ahead, handcuff me with that mind of yours. Take me to the cops. Make them believe you. Do you think that'll stop me? Do you think there's any jail that can hold me? Any guards that can keep me? Go ahead. You're the only force in this world that can chain me, and you can't watch me 24 hours a day. You've got to sleep sometimes and... Lori. Lori, you're choking. <laughs> you would break loose. Wouldn't you, Alan? You would kill again, in spite of all I could do to stop you. All right, you can breathe now. No, don't look at me like that. I'm not going to kill you. Even now, I can't do that. That gun of yours is in your inside pocket. Lift your right hand, Alan. Put it inside your coat. Now, take out the gun. Don't try to fight my will, Alan. You know it's no use. Now, you will point it at me. No. No, Laurie, not you. Anyone but you. Not you, Laurie, not you. Can't you hear me? Jeannie. Sweetheart, just try to move your finger. Or your eyes. Just, just move your eyes a little so I'll know you'll hear me. Jeannie, I can't move. I can't do anything. Help me. Oh, no. It's like being buried alive. I'm paralyzed. Help me. Lori. Lori, come back and help me. Lori. Lori. In 
And so, Alan had his wish fulfilled. Alan wanted immunity from uh, consequences of his actions. There's only one way to achieve it, and he achieved it. If you do nothing, if you have no actions, whatever, then you have immunity from consequences. And that's the only way. Otherwise, you're responsible for what you do, whether you like it or not. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight from Mandel Kramer and Bryna Raber. Script was by Gordon Dixon. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Bill Maher speaking. We pause now for station identification. I've been telling you about how I use Magic Mind mental performance shot with my morning routine. It's kind of like motivation in a bottle for me. Well, the other day I forgot to take it, but I remembered around lunchtime. This accident turned out to be beneficial because I found that Magic Mind helps me even more if I wait until around lunchtime to take it. I work really late nights here in the Weird Darkness studio doing the podcast and also doing voiceovers for my clients, and Magic Mind, if I take it around noon, it gives me the energy and the motivation that I need for a long workday. Magic Mind is offering you three free bottles so you can see how it works for you. This is different than the other URL that I gave you before, because I can only offer this for just a few weeks. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarknesstrial, and then use my code DARKNESSTRIAL, all one word, and get three free bottles of Magic Mind. Again, this is for a very short time, magicmind.com slash weirddarknesstrial, and then use my code Darkness Trial for your free three mental performance shots of Magic Mind. This is Five After the Hour by Les Weinrot. <laughs> Play the theme, for this is five after the hour. Play the theme, for this is an invitation to the drama. after the hour is the composition of Sal Stocko, and the orchestra is under the direction of Cesar Petrillo. And now, the play. A play entitled, There Was This Waltz. This wall, see? It's the first piece we hear the band playing when we get on this excursion boat. Mean Willie, the boat is the Mary Ann. That's that dancing excursion boat, the one that docks at the foot of the river. You know, midnight cruise out on the lake, leaves 11 p.m., returns 1 a.m., gents one dollar, ladies 50 cents. Well, Willie and me are scrounging around with nothing particular in mind when we see this here boat. And the crowd's hanging over the bridge watching it. Hey, 
Hey, let's go. On that tub? Are you nuts? Look at the dames pouring on. Come on. Oh, we'll go nuts, Willie. Two hours. And if you don't like it, there's nothing you can do about it. So what? The fresh air will do you good. Fresh air can poison you. Hey. Hey, the plant babe. That one? <laughs> no, over there. That's for me. Yeah. But how about me? She's got to have a girlfriend. Every blonde has. <laughs> okay, wise guy. <laughs> so you shanghai me onto this tub. Now, where's your blonde? She'll show. Blondes can't stay away from dance bands. And where's her girlfriend? I thought you said I'm... Ouch! Ah, see? what I tell you? They're coming in through the door. I don't like mine. Well, maybe she's a good dancer. Maybe she talks good. Maybe she... Maybe she's kind to her mother. Brother, look at that face. Come on. You go. Come on, you got nothing else to do anyway. Okay, okay. Oh, the way you get me into things. Honest, sometimes I think I'm a jerk. Now, what do we do now? Just barge up oh, and... Oh, now, don't be a stoop. You've got to use technique. Um, <clears throat> great number, this waltz. Hi, huh, Harry. I say, great little waltz. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I heard um, Wayne Wayne play it last week. Great little band that Wayne's got. Huh? Huh? Oh, oh sure. The dull crowd, yeah. don't you think, Elsie? Maybe we should have gone to dance. Yeah, uh, Wayne is for me. Smooth and sweet. I <laughs> love dance land. But you said... That's the way I like it. There. Smooth and sweet. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, smooth. I guess these excursion boats draw families mostly, don't you think? It's a shame like, to hear music like that and not be on. able to dance. Oh, well. We can always enjoy the it's ride. It's a waste. A pure waste. Sure is. Sure is. Of course, I'd rather not dance unless I can dance with someone who really knows how. We can uh, go on the upper deck Same and look here. at the moon. Ah. Some technique. Why don't you hit him with a ball bat? Strange, isn't it, Elsie? You know, Harry? Some people just stare and that stare. That blonde looks familiar. Yeah. She ought to. You've been looking at her long enough. I wonder if I met her Careful, when I was honey. in Hollywood. Yeah, sure. Your eyes She's will bug out Hutton. altogether. Oh, You're, you're Errol Flynn. Ridiculous. Come on. He is cute. Isn't I he? sure would like to dance. Personally, I like mine ugly. What's and stopping you? you are Fred Astaire them. does all right by himself. Um, Isn't this a divine night for dancing? Uh, Pardon me, my uh, fool. Uh, excuse me, but may I speak with you? They ain't taxing the air yet. Uh, no, no, I mean this other lady. Oh, were you speaking to me? He's been trying to since the dance started. At least two of us aren't blind. <laughs> you two sound like you're rehearsed, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. Well, you two sure don't. <laughs> Sister, you said it. <laughs> when you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to dance? Would she care? Why, uh, I don't know. We haven't been properly introduced. He's Willie and I'm Harry. <laughs> She's Mary and I'm Elsie there. Now that you two have been Emily posted, go ahead. Well? Well, all right. How about you? My feet hurt. They're killing me, to be utterly frank. Yeah, so are mine. Honest, some days I think I ain't gonna be able to walk another step. Away. How'd you like to stand up behind a counter all day and make with a smile when your dogs are barking? Elsie's a little too frank, but she's really a swell kid. Oh, so's Harry. I mean, not too sharp, but he's he's uh, he's a man's man. Well, that's why I run around with Elsie. Huh? Uh, oh, oh, I mean, oh, oh. <laughs> she's regular. You know how most women are. I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't think I was too forward. You see, you're the reason I got on this boat. 
I saw you getting on, and I, 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 I just couldn't help it. Me? Uh-huh. Yeah, you. I saw that blonde hair, and I, I, I just couldn't help it. <laughs> I dragged poor Harry with me. Oh. oh, I bet you tell that to all the blondes. I bet I don't. And, and I, I bet plenty of guys tell you that. Well, I'm not saying yes. And I'm not saying no. You don't have to. The way you look, the way you dance. Oh, Willie. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> Boy, am I glad I came. Hey, you're not with anyone. I, I mean, you, you didn't come here with anyone. Elsie and I just got on. For a whim, you might say. Oh, that's swell. Whew. Like to dance? Mm-hmm. So do I. Boy, I think that anybody who don't dance is missing a lot of romance. Nothing like dancing, I say. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. You give me a good band, a good floor, and a gal that knows how to dance. Yes, sir. Me too. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. What is? I had a hunch something wonderful was going to happen tonight. You did? Really? Yep. Harry and I were just scrounging around. Thought, uh, thought maybe we'd go over to where us guys hang out and, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe play a little gin rummy with the boys. That's what we thought. I'll bet you were going to play with some of the guys. No, we were, honest. And something, something drew me here. It was just, just, just like a magnet. Honest? <laughs> Honest. I'm glad I came. So am I. Oh, oh gosh, it's over. Yeah, <laughs> went like that. Wasn't that a short number? No, your dancing made it seem short. Oh, thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hey, I wonder where Harry and what's her name are? Elsie. Elsie. I, uh, I don't see them. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they're up on the moonlight deck. Oh, Elsie would never go up there with a strange man. Uh, wanna bet? I bet anything. We'll never find out unless we go up there ourselves. I don't really think I ought to. Don't you trust me? Well... Or don't you trust yourself? My, we're pretty confident of ourselves, aren't we? Uh-uh. I'm just confident about us. Come on, Mary. All right, folks. Get a while or hot. Red Hots, Red Hots, Coney Island Red Hots, those juicy, tasty pigs and bun, Red Hots, Red... Well, you two gonna buy just gonna stand there and look at them dogs. What you, waiting for them to bark? Temperament with hot dogs yet. We'll take two. With mustard, piccalilli, and ketchup. Too bad you weren't on board last night. We had anchovy sauce, too. Here you are. That'll be 30 cents. No tax for the floor show? Yeah, come on. You don't make for no appetite. Okay. Poor guy's probably got bunions. Get your red hots. Red hots here. Pick the bun. Can't go and cruise without one. Do you mind if we sit while we work up our indigestion? It's okay by me. Where? Hmm. This chair taken? Well, it will be if that jerk ever gets back. Hope you strike gold, lady. Excuse me for a minute, he says. That was an hour ago. Oh, I hope he gets himself good and lost. Nothing like a moonlight cruise to bring out the romance. Yeah. I never was one for the romance department. Too much wear and tear. <laughs> From the looks of you, I'd say there was plenty of room for wear and tear. You sure are a sweet character, aren't you? You kidding? If that's what you were looking for, you should have tied on to Mary. Oh, no. Oh, I leave that department to Willie. 
He's the smooth wolf. Would you mind not walking on my feet? I got corns and they hurt. Sorry. Try soaking them in salt water. Thanks. When they hurt too bad, I go to a foot doctor. A fellow named Gillespie. <laughs> He's a good man. Where do you think they are? Up on the moonlight deck. Huh? What do you think they're doing? Lying to each other. That Mary is a terrific con artist. Oh, oh don't worry. Willie ain't so bad himself. Right now, um, she's making with the eyes. You know, fluttering the lashes and saying, Oh, Willie, I wish you meant it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying, But I do mean it. No girl ever hit me the way you do. Oh, Willie, I wish you meant it. But I do mean it. No girl ever hit me the way you do. Honest? Honest. Oh, Mary. You two were sure lovey <gasps> dovey. Hey. Oh, you're a, you're, you're a hateful, spying little monster. Hey, go on, kid. Scram for it. Let you have it. You and what army? Boy, are you two sure ridiculous. Hey. Oh, Willie. Oh, Willie, I. I feel so. so cheap. Don't. Don't, honey. Don't, don't, don't let anything upset the beauty of. Of this. I'll try not to. You you do think it's beautiful? Sure I do. Willie, there it is again. Our waltz. Our waltz. What'd you say? Huh? Willie. What'd you say? Oh, mm-hmm. Do you think things like this? are meant to be. Mary, I think everything is meant to be. Oh, when you say things like that, I'm afraid. Afraid of what? You're so deep. Oh, I'm not so deep. It's just, just, just that I think a lot. And you dance so wonderfully. So do you. What's the matter? Nothing. Well, then, why then? I don't know. It's. it's just that I feel that tomorrow you won't even remember I'm alive. Oh, I'll remember. Tomorrow and tomorrow. Oh, that's so poetic. Who was it said that? Ronald Coleman. Uh huh. You'll look like Ronald Coleman someday when you get gray. And you look better than any movie star, right now. Really? Really. (laughs) Do I remind you of anyone? Alice Faye. (laughs) Just guessing. No, no, no. No, you do look like her. You're, uh, you're younger, of course. Everybody says I look like Betty Hutton. I mean, around the eyes. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Betty... Betty... Hutton. Oh, well... (sighs) Were you thinking of her? Or me? Don't. Don't. Don't talk. (sighs) Come on, let's go find Harry and Elsie. Oh, Willie, I just love everybody tonight. I thought they'd never leave. So did I. Did you ever hear such a line? Yeah, they were really feeding it to each other. Oh, look at that moon. Mm-hmm. Lover's moon. For us. For us. You two are sure lovey-dovey. I don't know where. 
and I've had such a good time. You? You had a good time? Oh, Mary, I, I just began to live tonight. Personally, I feel like dying. Are you two gonna stand here on the dock forever? Yeah. I gotta get up at seven tomorrow. Hey, can't you save it for another night? Don't pay any attention to them. I won't, Mary. And I am gonna save it for all the nights of my life. With you. Willie. Thanks for the hot dogs, Harry. That's okay, Elsie. Hey, I sure enjoyed sitting them dancers out. Yeah, so did I. And Harry. Yeah? Now, don't forget what I told you about Dr. Tornu's magic remover. Oh, no, no, I won't. And get the big size. Save half a dollar. Sure, that's half a buck. Okay. And I will see you tomorrow night. And Wednesday. And Thursday. Mm-hmm. I'll have to break a date both nights. Do you mind? Uh-uh. I'd lots rather be with you. Oh, boy. They say... Elsie. Yeah. Well, uh, I've been thinking. I think you're wrong about that ketchup. You try mixing it with mustard for, uh, for a week, say. You'll never eat a hot dog any other way. Hmm. Hmm. Could be. Well... Thanks again. Be seeing you. Yeah. Sure. I'll sit out of waltz with you any day. Yeah. Night. This wall, see? It's the first piece we hear the band playing when we got on this excursion boat. Uh, me and Willie. Harry! Uh, You're gonna stand there and yammer all night? In a minute, Elsie. It's the old lady. Yeah, we were married six months ago. She's got bad feet. So have I. This makes us turn in early. Uh, what happened to Mary and Willie? Well, Mary got hooked up with a sailor she'd been corresponding with. And Willie... Ah, uh, Willie, he's still playing the field, the jerk. Was This Waltz was written, directed, and produced by Les Weinrat, and the orchestra was under the direction of Caesar Petrillo. Heard tonight were Mary Lou Newmeyer, Sherman Marks, Janet Niles, Charles Irving, Tom Moore, Lucy Gilman, Clock Ryder, Tony Weinrat, Johnny Coons, and Adrian Moore. <laughs>
victory has been won. But the fight at home continues. Yes, it is vitally important to save waste paper. Paper shipped overseas in the form of packages for our armed forces never returns. It can never again be used as a raw material to keep our paper mills operating. And the requirements for paper are even greater than before, both overseas and here at home. Overseas to keep our men supplied. At home, to provide the packaging for the increased civilian goods that will soon be available. Save your waste paper. It's important. It's vital. It's necessary for the peace we have won. After the Hour by Les Weinrat, originated in the studios of WBBM, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Micro Terrors, 10 Scary Stories for Kids, Volume 2, a collection of original short horror stories for children ages 8 and up. In this haunted audio, you'll listen to terrifying tales of creatures, folklore, ghosts, mystical crimes, and more spine-chilling spooks. Micro Terrors, 10 Scary Stories for Kids, Volume 2, includes I Created a Hoax, The Nibbler, Might of the Gargoyle, Don't Take the Stairs, Silhouettes, Off the Rails, A Leprechaun's Gold, Little Red Cap, The Wolf's Paw, and more. Micro Terrors, 10 Scary Stories for Kids, Volume 2. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Now for excitement and adventure in the world of the future. Entertainment for the entire family produced right here in Kalamazoo. Join us now for a voyage into another dimension. A journey into our realm as an infinite and limitless as time itself. Our destination, the farthest reaches of the imagination. WMUK Special Projects presents Future Tales. <laughs> The Old Die Rich by H. L. Gold. The uniformed cop at the door told me to get lost, but Lou Pape spotted me and told the man to let me in. It was a shabby room. They always are. And there was a woman on the bed, an old woman with white hair, thin enough to show the tight-drawn scalp. The medical examiner was going over her as if she were a side of beef that you had to put a federal grade stamp on. Sergeant, when are you going to stop taking this ham friend of yours around to these cases just to satisfy his morbid curiosity? Forget about Weldon, Doc. What did she die of? Not eating. Malnutrition. Oh, now look, Doc. In the top bureau drawer, she had bank books showing $32,000 from five different banks. She had the price of a meal. Malnutrition induced by senile psychosis. They starve because they are less afraid of death than digging into their savings. Well, I don't know, Doc. It doesn't feel right to me. Listen, Weldon. Just because you get up on a stage or on some half-baked television show and make believe you're 70 years old 
doesn't qualify you as an expert on gerontology. Well, maybe not, Doc. But I went bald at 25 and have been playing old men ever since. There's a lot more to it than just shuffling. There hasn't been an actor since Otis Kidd. Well, maybe. But the way I work, I, I have to get inside the character. I, I have to decide when he was born, how he got along with his father, where he went to school, what he thinks of women, everything about a character. There isn't any one of them these days that can make himself hurt past the fifth row. Now, now, look, I'm serious. Now, I've tried imagining myself growing weak from hunger. I I've tried to think of not even spending a nickel to keep me from dying. Well, I just don't believe it. It isn't right. I don't feel it. Well, lucky for me, I don't have to feel these things inside of me because I'm a doctor, not an actor. Sergeant, malnutrition induced by senile psychosis. I'll order the wicker basket. So long, Barlamar. Well, he's right, Mark. We get a couple of these cases every year. Some old codger starving to death with $17,000 in old bills pinned on his union suit. Turns up all the time. Well, it doesn't feel right. Well, he knows his business. Yeah, but he doesn't know old people. I do. Now, it isn't easy to starve to death. Not when you can buy day-old bread at the bakery or, or withered vegetables at the grocer's ready to throw out. Now, anyone who's willing to eat that stuff can stay alive the day to day. Why, hunger is a... Well, it's a pretty potent instinct. Well, maybe they get too sick to go out for old bread or wilted vegetables. Oh, it takes weeks to die of starvation. Did you ever try starving for weeks, Lou? No. Did you? Well, the, the point is somebody would find out. A janitor, a, a landlord, somebody. And they'd get him to a hospital. Ah, oh, forget about it, Mark. Can't argue with it. Here. There were five bank books, $32,000. Huh. Say, she took good care of them. They look almost new. Sure she did. Most important thing in the world to her. April 23rd, 1924. $150. Yeah, that ink's pretty dark. Now, shouldn't it be faded? She probably never took it out in the light. Anyone ever think of testing the ink? What for? Banks' records always check. These aren't forgeries, if that's what you're thinking. Well, I'd like to get a chemist working on this. Oh, now look, Mark. This is strictly against regulations. i got to take these books down to the squad room and sign them in. Well, it's pretty dark ink for 1924. Oh, well, it's about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, huh? I guess I could hold them over tonight and bring them down to the property clerk in the morning. Oh, good. I know just where I can find a chemist. Mr. Weldon, there's no doubt of it. The ink sample is typical of inks used 50 years ago. 1924 would be about right. There, you see, Weldon, and I was supposed but to... But according to the amount of oxidation, it's fresh enough to be only a few months old. Now, there. I was right. Well, couldn't that be the result of unusually careful handling? Yes, I suppose it could. Uh, in an airtight compartment, perhaps. Sealed with one of the inert gases or a vacuum. That might account for the lack of normal aging. Oh, Lou, you can't keep inert gases in the top bureau drawer in a fourth-floor walk-up. Yeah, well, it's probably some simple explanation. For fresh ink, half a century old. I've been going out on these cases for about a year. It's my specialty playing old people. And when I'm not working television or the theater, I go down to the homes for the aged or, or the parks and just watch. Lou Papes, an old friend of mine, he put me onto these malnutrition cases. But there was more to it than just picking up color and tricks of the trade. There had to be a better reason for it. You can't just starve to death. Upwards of $30,000 right at your fingertips... Not without at least buying a bowl of soup. I had a run of television that kept me busy for about a month. And then Lou called me up and asked me to come down to a city hospital. I'll perform an autopsy, Sergeant, if you want. But I can give you the cause of death right now. Malnutrition due to senile psychosis. 
Well, what's up, Lou? Well, Mark, an old guy was found wandering around down on Hester Street suffering from malnutrition. He had seventeen thousand dollars in cash inside the lining of his jacket. Oh, is uh, is he alive? No, not now. He isn't. Doc's got him in the room there, but he was stumbling around when the cop on the beat picked him up. Oh, did he say anything? Well, he talked to the cop. The cop's a pretty smart young kid. It seems the old man kept talking about money, about his wife. Uh, she must have been dead twenty years. And then, just before he went out completely, he did say something, maybe. Three or four times. Well, what was it? El Greco. You mean the artist? Well, that's what Stankowicz said. He's the officer who picked him up. El Greco. Probably some Greek restaurant where he was bumming his meals. Now, you sure you want an autopsy, Sergeant? It's late. I won't get it till tomorrow. All right. Take your time, Doc. There's something else, isn't there, Lou? Maybe, Mark. They found the old guy's room, and there was an ad thumbtacked over the sink. Uh, nothing too unusual. Yeah? Here it is. Uh, men and women want it. Light work. Suitable for old people. No references required. Yeah, well, I checked it out with the lieutenant. He says to forget it. Says it figures for an old guy to be interested in an ad like that. <laughs> an old guy with $17,000 in cash? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I didn't figure I'd argue with the lieutenant. Do you uh, mind if I keep it? No, oh, go ahead. It was an old brownstone house in the East 80s. I got in line with the rest of the applicants. My face was lined with collodion wrinkles, and I wore an indie shiny suit and run-down shoes. It was a good makeup job. I looked more authentic than the rest of the old timers who were waiting for the interview. I finally came up to where a woman was asking the question. Name? Uh, Kernit. Uh, Louis Kernit. Uh, Kernit. Mm, address? Well, I don't exactly have a place. I've been staying with a fellow down on 12th Street, uh, a friend of mine. I, I met him in the cafeteria. Previous occupation? Well, I've worked at a lot of things. I used to be a printer way back. I could hand set... Do you have any references? Well, uh, Oh, no, ma'am. I I haven't got any family. I had a a cousin in Salt Lake City, but I I haven't seen him in 30 years or more. The ad said you didn't need no reference. Well, that's right. Now, will you wait in the other room? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, do I get the job, man? Just wait in the other room. I shuffled into the other room and sat down to wait. I concentrated on building a character for Louis Kernet. If I was going to carry this through, I was going to have to play a better performance than I'd ever given before. About half an hour later, a young woman came into the room. I planned to be dozing the way an old man would, and so my eyes were closed and I heard the door close. When I opened them, I was looking into the barrel of a thirty-eight revolver. Are you awake now, Mr. Huh? Weldon? Oh, I don't think you need to carry on anymore. If you need any further convincing, you are Mark Weldon. You're about 40 years old, and you played the same character on television about six weeks ago. You played it fairly well. Well, thank you. Now, would you uh, mind putting down that gun? Yes. Why did you apply for this position, Mr. Weldon? You're not old, not really. Uh, well, uh, as a matter of fact, it, it was a bet. I I was having an argument with another actor, and I bet him that uh, that I could do well. I could get by off the Don't stage. Don't bother. Just... You've been very busy recently trying to find out my senile psychotics starve themselves to death. How did you know that? I also happen to know that you've been present at several police investigations into these cases, and that your good friend is Sergeant Lou Pape. Well, you know a great deal more about me than I do about you. Well, I'll be glad to enlighten you. My name is May Roberts. I'm the daughter of the late Dr. Anthony Roberts, the physicist who was dismissed from the Brookhaven Atomic Energy Laboratory five years ago. Well, I assume you're connected with these starvation cases or you wouldn't have known that I was investigating. It's obvious, isn't it? I'm not afraid of professional detectives, Mr. Weldon. They deal only in facts. But I don't like amateurs. They guess too much. They don't stick to reality. Consequently, they're likely to get too close to the truth. Oh, unfortunately, Miss Roberts, I'm nowhere near the truth. I haven't the slightest idea how you're tied in with those starvation cases. Well, I intend to show you, Mr. Weldon. 
I'm happy to announce that you have the job. Oh, no, no, Don't no, move, no, Mr. I... Weldon. Oh, incidentally, about 15 minutes ago, I called Sergeant Pape and told him I was your sister just in from Pittsburgh. I wanted to get in touch with you very badly, and Sergeant Pape was very sorry. He wished he could help me, but he didn't have the slightest idea where you were. All right, Mr. Weldon, walk ahead of me, please, through that door. <laughs> She didn't look like the kind of girl who would hold a gun on me without intending to use it. So I went down the hall and up four flights of stairs to a large room. There was a maze of electrical equipment folded down, transistors and wires and dials. In the middle of the room was a wire mesh cage. She kept that gun on me steady as a rock. She began to set readings on the dials and flip switches on the control panel. It'll take about five minutes for the field to build up, Mr. Weldon. Please get into the transmission area. Oh, you mean that wire cage? Go ahead. Well, all right, all right. I wouldn't advise moving now, Mr. Weldon. The wire carries some 10,000 volts. Oh, now, now look, Miss Roberts. Mr. Uh... Weldon, you're curious, and you could turn out to be a great nuisance to me. As long as you've come this far, we might as well both benefit by it. Benefit? You'll find a suit of clothes on the floor there. Put it on. Oh, but after all, Put that... it on. <laughs> I didn't know whether she was bluffing about the electric charge, but the revolver looked real enough, so I stripped and changed into the other clothes. The shoes were a little too tight and pointed. The collar of the shirt was too stiffly starched and too high under my chin. The suit was too narrow at the shoulders, at the ankles. I remember my father had a suit like that, the same shiny blue serge. All right. In your pocket, you'll find a set of envelopes. You'll find a set of instructions in each. Follow them carefully. I, I don't get it. You will. Use the envelopes in the order they are arranged. Hey, what's this all about? Mr. Weldon, I meant it when I said this could be a benefit to both of us. There's no use explaining anything. You'll find out, and don't try to escape. It can't be done. All right? Now the field generators are ready. Now look, Miss Roberts, this is absolutely... Just follow instructions, Mr. Weldon. I blinked, and I was standing outside a bank on a sunny day in spring. I stared at the people passing by. They were dressed like the characters in a 1930 movie. The women wore long dresses and flower-pot hats. The men had hard straw hats and suits with narrow shoulders. The cars were square with flat radiators in front. And there was a trolley car passing by. And suddenly I, I realized that the last trolley stopped running years ago. And I tried to figure it out. It was my town, all right. I recognized some of the buildings. At first, I, I figured it must have been hypnosis. And then I looked at the first of the envelopes in my pocket... I read it and walked into the bank. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Golden tells me that you wish to open an account. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Well, we're very happy to have a new depositor. Very happy indeed. Of course, you realize the institution is in sound condition. Very sound. You needn't worry about all those rumors in this bank. No, sir. Solid. Solid. Oh, that's good. Well, now, name? Mark Weldon. You have no address in the city at present, Mr. Weldon? No, 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 I don't. And you're depositing $150. Oh, that's right. All righty, I'll just check the slip here. $150, right. And the date, May 15th, of course, 1931. 31? The Depression. Oh, now, Mr. Weldon, this is a very good year for business. This temporary recession is bound to abate. Sound banking policies will see us through. It's just around the corner, you know. What? What is? Prosperity. Oh. All right, Mr. Weldon. We're very happy to have your account. I went outside the bank, and I stood there in the spring sunlight and let the terror soak into me. The possibility that the entire situation was gnawing at the edges of my mind. And then, suddenly... I wasn't there. 
It was as fast as blinking. I was outside another bank in the same city. And the date on the next envelope was May 29th. And it was still 1931. I made a $75 deposit there, and then $100 at another place a few days later, spending a few minutes each time and going ahead anywhere from a couple of days to almost a month. In 1934, I found myself inside a broker's office. Hmm, as I understand it, you are buying this stock for uh, Dr. Anthony Roberts, hmm? That's right. I assume the stock will be in his name? That's right. I'm just acting as his agent. I follow instructions. Of course, of course. Well, are you sure I can't convince you that you're making a big mistake? No, no. These are my instructions. Well, now, Mr. Weldon, we are a reputable brokerage house, and frankly, I feel quite shaky about putting our client's money in this kind of security. There's no future in it. It's a rare metal for which there's very little use in industrial purposes. However, if your client is adamant... I have my instruction. Very well, then. In the name of Dr. Anthony Roberts, 100 shares of Montana uranium. Most unwise. It went that way about 50-50. I'd deposit money in my own name in various banks, and other times I'd buy stock or make a bet for May Roberts. On June 21st, 1932... I bet Jack Sharkey to take the heavyweight title away from Max Schmeling. There was Singing Wood in 1933 at Belmont Park, and Max Bear over Primo Canera. I went on, skimming through the years, touching here and there, from a few minutes to an hour at a time. It was in early October 1938, about five hours after I left May Roberts' house, before I realized what she had me doing. I was making deposits and and winning sure bets just as those senile psychotics had done. The ink on their bank books seemed fresh because it was fresh. It wasn't given a chance to oxidize. Why, at the rate I was going, I'd be back in my own time in a few hours with $15,000 compound interest in cash. But those old people had died of starvation somehow with all that cash in banks. Now, I didn't know how it happened or, or why, but suddenly it occurred to me that I didn't want to be found dead in my hotel room. So rather than make the deposit in 1938, I grabbed a cab and told the driver to step on it. We got a mile away from the bank, and then the cab suddenly disappeared. I found myself in front of a counter at a lunchroom. The envelope instructed me to make a bet on the World Series. Uh, There wasn't any way to get out of the range of the machine. It could pick me up at least five miles away from where I was supposed to be. I came back a week later to get my winnings. I was hungry, so I got myself a hamburger and went out the door. And when I hit the sidewalk, it happened again. Don't touch the cage yet, Mr. Weldon. I'll have to clear the charge. Hey, hey well, what happened to my hamburger? What? The hamburger I had in here, is it's gone. Hey, I'm hungry. I'll get you something to eat, Mr. Weldon, before your next trip. Well, you've done pretty well for yourself, haven't you? Well, yes, yes, I have. About $15,000. Well, Mr. Weldon, I want to talk seriously with you. Now that you've seen part of what I'm doing. Part? My father was discharged from all his research and university connections because he insisted on publishing his findings on temporal field research. All the conventional physicists explained that he was overworked and recommended everything from psychoanalysis to hot bouillon before retiring. Well, possibly both of these might have been beneficial. But the fact of the matter is, temporal field activities are quite true. And you've seen proof. Well, I I suppose I have. It seems just to be a question of money. And obviously, I can get all I need now. But sending people back through time to bet on sure things like uranium... For exchange, I pay well for service, don't I? Well, I suppose so. That isn't the most important thing. I've been able to save things that could have been lost otherwise. I've sent people back to find precious treasures that would have been destroyed or would have disappeared. Yeah, like an El Greco painting? Yes, and the original score of Mozart's magic flute that would have been burned in 1942. And a Picasso miniature that would have been lost at sea in 52. I have them all here. Stolen? No, 
bought with money from the year itself at a fair price. Well, Mr. Weldon, I sent you back because I needed someone to work with me on a regular basis. Someone who's faster and more alert than the old people I've hired until now. Well, why old it's people? It's a function of the field. You can't send somebody back to a year in which they didn't exist at all. Hey, I'm hungry. Please, Mr. Weldon, this is very important. My father died trying to prove the validity of his field theory to conventional scientists. I don't intend to bother. We can become the most powerful people in the world. Well, I don't feel very powerful now. now you, you haven't got a sandwich hanging around, have you? I want to make you an offer, Mr. Weldon. I need someone to help me expand the operation, plan the projects and research. I chose you because I was afraid that you might hit on the truth by yourself. Can I come out of this cage now? Be careful. Don't touch the contacts. The field reacts on a random factor for at least one hour after it's cut off. Uh, believe me, I'll be careful. Now tell me, Miss Roberts, why haven't you been able to go back to the time when your father was alive and, and bring him back before he died? The dead tissue can't be transported. We've tried it with mice and rabbits from the laboratory, and they just disappear. Yeah, like my hamburger. Mr. Weldon, I assume that you're interested, and that we can make our plans without using this revolver. Well, I hope so. Fifteen thousand dollars is a lot of money. Of course, you were able to send those old people back a lot further. Some of them as far back as 1890. Now, how long would they be gone? Now, I mean in subjective time. Several weeks, perhaps a month or more. There's only one problem, Miss Robert. Well, I'm sure we can work out any detail. Well, this one is a little hard to work out. Now, you see, I'm hungry. I haven't been this hungry since I got lost on a hunting trip and went without food for three days. You see, you forgot that I've got an interest in this business because they found some old people dead of malnutrition and $30,000 or so tucked away in their pockets. Now, they'd been gone a month or more, and they had to eat during that time, didn't they? Now, when they came back, the food disappeared like my hamburger. It disappeared all at once, all over their body. In one fast jolt, they starved to death. No, no, you, you don't understand. They just couldn't take the field transition. They were too old, some of them. They lied to me about their age to get the job. Oh, no, you can't tell me that, because I know how hungry I am. And I was only gone about 12 hours. They were murdered. Get back. Now, you know, they say a hungry man gets mighty desperate. He'll do almost anything. Ah. Yeah, I'll let go. Let go of that gun now. Let go of it. My arm. Look out. Look out. The cage. The contact. Oh. She fell into that cage and disappeared before she hit the ground. I didn't know what happened. I knew she said the field worked in a, a random factor, whatever that meant. I called Lou Pape, and he came to the house just after the fire started. Something went in the control panel, and it turned out to be a four-alarm fire before they got it under control. There was nothing left of the machine. There wasn't much left of the brownstone house. Lou didn't believe the story, I told him. You mean there won't be any more of them? No more senile psychotics starving to death with a bankroll in their pocket? No, I told you, Lou. Come on now, Mark. We'll get plenty more. We always no, have. No, no, I bet you won't. I bet you a dollar there won't be another case like that. Uh, I'll take that bet. I lost the bet. There was one more case, and perhaps it was the strangest one. A woman was found wandering in Bryant Park just before she died of acute starvation. One strange thing was that she was young, not more than 30. And the other was that she had $17,000 stuffed in her pocketbook and a bullet wound in her arm that the medical examiner said was at least two months old. I guess that's what she meant by the random factor. WMUK Special Projects has presented The Old Die Rich. 
Written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Fox Pink was featured as Weldon and Peg Small played Mae Roberts. Others in our cast were Robert L. Smith, Richard Niesink, Martin Gingrich, and John Scott. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Next, on Future Tense. Shh, we've got to be quiet now. Henry, this is fantastic. But they've got a tunnel right under the whole town. You haven't seen anything yet. There's a room a little farther down. We'll be able to look through a glass in the door. Is it safe? Yes, unless one of them comes along. Now, come on. Okay. Here, Berger, look through the glass. And just so I know I'm not completely insane, tell me what you see. Good Lord. Well, shit. Tremendous panel with dozens of telescreens. In front of each a robot. They seem to be computing something. Yes, I watched. They're evaluating data on the screens. Have you gotten a chance to look at that data on those screens? No, I've been afraid to go in. There might be a warning circuit somewhere. If we knew what those robots were working on, we could go to the authorities. I'll risk it if you will. All right. It's worth the chance. We're lost anyway. Okay, open the door. This is Gerard McLeod reminding you and your entire family to join us every Monday through Thursday at this same time for Future Tense. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio